page 90. Zed lifted an eyebrow, waiting. Richard looked down at the table, picking at the wood with his thumbnail. Think of the solution, not the problem. And right now you are doing it backwards. You are only concentrating on why the problem is impossible. You are not thinking of the solution. Richard knew Zed was right, but there was more to it. Zed, I don't think I'm qualified to be seeker. I don't know anything about the Midlands. Sometimes it is easier to make a decision if you aren't burdened with the knowledge of history, the wizard said cryptically. Richard let out a deep breath. I don't know the place. I'd be lost there. Kaylin put her hand on his forearm. No, you wouldn't. I know the Midlands better than almost anyone. I know where it is safe and where it is not. I'll be your guide. You will not be lost. I promise you that much. Richard looked away from her green eyes and down at the table. It hurt to think that he might disappoint her, but her faith and Zed's didn't seem justified. He didn't know anything about the Midlands, or the magic, or how to find some boxes, or how to stop Dark and Rawl. He didn't know how to do any of it. And for his first trick, he was supposed to get them across the boundary. Richard, I know you think I'm thrusting this responsibility on you unwisely, but it is not me who chooses you. You are the one who has shown himself to be the seeker. I have only recognized the fact. I have been a wizard a long time. You don't know what that entails, but you have to trust me when I say that I'm qualified to recognize the one. Zed reached across the table, across the sword, and put his hand on Richard's. His eyes were somber. Dark and Rahl hunts you, personally. The only reason I can fathom for this is that with the insight he has gained from the magic of Orden, he too knows you to be the one, and so searches you out to eliminate the threat. Richard blinked in surprise. Maybe Zed was right. Maybe this was the reason Rahl hunted him. Or maybe not. Zed didn't know about the book. He felt as if his mind would explode with all the things filling his head, and suddenly he couldn't sit anymore. He stood up and began pacing, thinking. Zed folded his arms across his chest. Kalen leaned an elbow on the table. Both watched in silence as he paced. The wisp had said to seek the answer or die. It didn't say it was necessary to become this seeker. He could find the answers in his own way, as he always had. He hadn't needed the sword to figure out who the wizard was, although it hadn't been that hard. But what was wrong with taking the sword? What could it hurt to have its help? Wouldn't it be foolish to turn down any assistance? Apparently the sword could be put to any use its owner wanted, so why not use it in the way he wanted? He didn't have to become an assassin or anything else. He could use it to help them. That was all. That was all that was needed or wanted. No more. But Richard knew why he didn't want it. He didn't like the way it had felt when he had drawn the sword. It had felt good, and that bothered him. It had stirred his anger in a way that frightened him, made him feel like he had never felt before. The most disconcerting thing was that it felt right. He didn't want to feel right about anger, didn't want to lose his control of it. Anger was wrong. That's what his father had taught him. Anger had killed his mother. He kept his anger behind a locked door he didn't want opened. No, he would do this in his own way, without the sword. He didn't need it didn't need the worry of it. Richard turned to Zed, who still sat with his arms folded across his chest, watching. The sunlight gave Zed's wrinkles deep shadows. The lines and sharp angles of his familiar face seemed somehow different. He looked grim, resolute, somehow more like a wizard. Their eyes met and held each other. Richard was decided. He would tell his friend no. He would help and would stand by them. His life, too, depended on this but he would not be the seeker. Before he could say so, Zed spoke. Kalen, tell Richard how Dark and Rahl questions people. His voice was quiet, calm. He didn't look at her, instead continuing to hold Richard's eyes. Her voice was barely audible. Zed, please, tell him. This time his voice was harder, more forceful. Tell him what he does with the curved knife he keeps at his belt. 
Richard looked away from Zed's eyes to her pale face. After a moment, she held out her hand and looked up at him with sad green eyes, beckoning him to come to her. He stood a moment, wary, then came and took her hand. She pulled him down toward her. He sat, straddling the bench, facing her, waiting for what it was she was bidden to say, fearing it. Kaylin shifted toward him, hooking some hair behind an ear, and looked down at his right hand as she held it in both of hers, stroking the back of it with her thumbs. Her fingers were gentle, soft, and warm against his palm. The size of her hands made his seem awkwardly large. She spoke quietly and didn't look up. Darkin Rao is a practitioner of an ancient form of magic called anthropomancy. He divines the answers to questions by the inspection of living human entrails. Richard felt his anger ignite. It's of limited use. He can at most get a yes or no to a single question, and sometimes a name. Nonetheless, he continues to favor its use. I'm sorry, Richard. Please forgive me for telling you this. Memories of his father's kindness, his laughter, his love, his friendship, their time together with the secret book and a thousand other brief glimpses tore through him in a flood of anguish. The scenes and sounds converged into dim shadows and hollow echoes in Richard's mind and melted away. In its place, memories of the bloodstains on the floor, the white faces of the people there, images of his father's pain and terror, and the things Chase had told him flashed vividly in snatches through his mind. He didn't try to stop them, but instead pulled them onward, hungering for them. He washed himself in the detail of it all, felt the twisting torment. Pain flared up from a pit deep inside him. Invoked heedlessly, it came screaming forth. In his mind, he added the shadowed figure of Dark and Rawl, hands dripping crimson blood standing over his father's body, holding the red, glinting blade. He held the vision before him, twisting it, inspecting it, drinking it into his soul. The picture was complete now. He had his answers. He knew how it had been, how his father had died. Until now, that was all he had ever sought, answers. In his whole life, he had never gone beyond that simple quest. In one white-hot instant, that changed. The door that held back his anger and the wall of reason containing his temper burned away in a flash of hot desire. A lifetime of rational thinking evaporated before his searing fury. Lucidity became dross in a cauldron of molten need. Richard reached out to the sword of truth, curled his fingers around the scabbard, gripping it tighter and tighter until his knuckles were white. The muscles in his jaw flexed. His breathing came fast and sharp. He saw nothing else of what was around him. The heat of anger surged forth from the sword, not of its own volition, but summoned by the seeker. Richard's chest heaved with the burning hurt of his grief at knowing now what had happened to his father. And with that knowledge, there was closure, too. Thoughts he had never permitted himself to have became his only desire. Caution and consequence vanished before a flood of lust for vengeance. In that instant, his only want, his only desire, his only need was to kill Dark and Rawl. Nothing else had any significance. With his other hand, he reached out and seized the hilt of his sword to pull it free. Zed's hand clamped down over his. The seeker's eyes snapped up, livid at the interference. Richard, Zed's voice was gentle. Calm down. The seeker, his muscles flexing powerfully, glowered into the other's tranquil eyes. Some part of him, deep in the back of his mind, kept warning him, trying to regain control. He ignored the warning. He bent over the table to the wizard, his teeth gritted. I accept the position of seeker. Richard, Zed repeated calmly, it's all right. Relax, sit down. The world came rushing back into his mind. He pulled his readiness to kill back a notch, but not his rage. Not only the door, but also the wall that had contained his anger was gone. Even though the world about him had returned, it was a world seen through different eyes. Eyes he had always had, but had been afraid to use. The eyes of a seeker. Richard realized that he was standing. He didn't remember getting up. He sat again next to Kalin, removing his hands from the sword. 
Something inside him regained control of his anger. It wasn't the same as before, though. It didn't shut it away. It didn't lock it behind a door, but pulled it back, unafraid, to make it ready when needed again. Some of his old self seeped back into his mind, calming him, slowing his breathing, reasoning within him. He felt liberated, unafraid, unashamed of his temper for the first time. He allowed himself to sit there while he uncoiled, feeling his muscles relax. He looked up into Zed's calm, undisturbed face. The old man, his thatch of white hair framing an angular face set in a perceptive cast, studied him, assessed him with the slightest hint of a smile fixed at the corners of his thin mouth. Congratulations, the wizard said. You have passed my final test to become Seeker. Richard pulled back in confusion. What do you mean? You already appointed me, Seeker. Zed shook his head slowly. I told you before, weren't you listening? A Seeker appoints himself. Before you could become Seeker, you had to pass one determinative test. You had to show me you could use all your mind. For many years, Richard, you have kept part of it locked away. Your anger. I had to know you could release it, call upon it. I've seen you angry, but you are unable to admit your anger to yourself. A seeker who couldn't allow himself to use his anger would be hopelessly weak. It is the strength of rage that gives the heedless drive to prevail. Without the anger, you would have turned down the sword and I would have let you, because you wouldn't have had what was required. But that is irrelevant now. You have proven you are no longer a prisoner to your fears. Be cautioned, though. As important as it is to be able to use your rage, it is equally important to be able to restrain it. You have always had that ability. Don't let yourself lose it now. You must be wise enough to know which path to choose. Sometimes... Letting out the anger is an even more grievous mistake than holding it in. Richard nodded solemnly. He thought about the way it felt to hold the sword when he was in the rage, the way he felt its power, the liberating sensation of giving himself over to the primal urge from within himself and from the sword. The sword has magic, he said guardedly. I felt it. It does. But Richard... Magic is only a tool, like any other. When you use a whetstone to sharpen a knife, you are simply making the knife work better for its intended purpose. Same way with the magic. It's just a honing of the intent. Zed's eyes were clear and sharp. Some people are more terrified to die by magic than, say, by a blade, as if somehow one is less dead if killed by a blow or a cut than if killed by the unseen. But listen well. Dead is dead. The fear of the magic, though, can be a powerful weapon. Keep that in mind. Richard nodded. The late afternoon sun warmed his face, and out of the corner of his eye he could see the cloud. Rahl would be watching it, too. Richard remembered the man from the quad on Blunt Cliff, how he had pulled his sword across his arm, drawing blood before he attacked. He remembered the look in the man's eyes. He hadn't understood it at the time. He understood it now. Richard hungered for the fight. The leaves of the nearby trees fluttered in the light autumn wind, glimmering with their first touches of gold and red. Winter was coming. The first day of winter would soon be here. He thought about how he would get them across the boundary. They had to get one of the boxes of Orden, and when they found it, they would find Rawl. Zed, no more games. I am seeker now. No more tests. True? True as toasted toads. Then we are wasting our time. I am sure Rawl is not wasting his. He turned to Kalen. I hold you to your pledge to be my guide when we reach the Midlands. She smiled at his impatience and nodded. Richard turned to Zed. Show me how the magic works, wizard. Chapter 10 Zed's impish smile spread across his face. He handed Richard the baldric. The finely tooled leather was old and supple. The gold and silver buckle matched the scabbard. It was adjusted too small, its last user having been smaller than Richard. 
Zed helped readjust it as Richard strapped it across his right shoulder and fit the sword of truth to it. Zed led them to the edge of the grass amid long shadows stretching from the nearby trees to where two small rock maples grew, one as thick as Richard's wrist, the other as thin as Kalin's. He turned to Richard. Draw the sword! The unique, ringing, metallic sound filled the late afternoon air as the sword came free. Zed leaned closer. Now, I will show you the most important thing about the sword, but to do so, I need you to briefly abdicate your post as Seeker and allow me to name Kalin Seeker. Kalin gave Zed a suspicious glare. I don't want to be Seeker. Just for the purpose of demonstration, dear one. He motioned for Richard to give her the sword. She hesitated before taking it in both hands. The weight was uncomfortable, and she allowed the point to lower until it rested on the grassy ground. Zed waved his hands over her head with a flourish. Kalen Amnail, I name you Seeker. She continued to give him the same suspicious stare. Zed put his finger under her chin, tilting her head up. His eyes had a fierce intensity. He put his face close to hers, speaking in a low voice. When I left the Midlands with this sword, Dark and Raal used his magic to place the larger of these two trees here to mark me, to be able to come for me at a time of his choosing so he could kill me. The same Dark and Raal who had Denis killed. Her countenance became darker. The same Dark and Raal who hunts you to kill you like he killed your sister. Hate flared in her eyes. Her teeth clenched, making the muscles in her strong jawline stand out. The Sword of Truth rose from the ground. Zed stepped behind her. This tree is his. You must stop him. The blade flashed through the autumn air with speed and power Richard could scarcely believe. The arc of its sweep went through the larger tree with a loud crack, like a thousand twigs snapping at once. Splinters flew everywhere. The tree seemed to hang in the air a moment then dropped down next to the ragged stump before toppling over with a crash. Richard knew it would have taken him at least ten blows with a good axe to have felled the maple. Zed slipped the sword from Kalin's hands as she sank to her knees and rocked back on her heels, putting her hands over her face with a moan. Instantly, Richard crouched at her side, steadying her. Kalin, what's wrong? I'm all right. She laid a hand on his shoulder as he helped her to her feet. Her face was pale as she forced a small smile. But I resigned my post as seeker. Richard spun to the wizard. Zed, what is this nonsense? Dark and Rawl didn't put that tree there. I've seen you water and care for those two trees. If you held a knife to my throat, I'd say you planted them there as a memorial to your wife and daughter. Zed gave only a small smile. Very good, Richard. Here is your sword. You are seeker again. Now, my boy, you cut down the little tree, and then I will explain. Annoyed, Richard took the sword in both hands, feeling the anger surge through him. He gave a mighty swing at the remaining tree. The tip of the blade whistled as it sliced through the air. Just before the blade hit the tree, it simply stopped, as if the very air about it had become too thick to allow it to pass. Richard stepped back in surprise. He looked at the sword and then tried again. Same thing. The tree was untouched. He glared over at Zed, who stood with his arms folded and a smirk on his face. Richard slid the sword back into its scabbard. All right, what's going on? Zed lifted his eyebrows with an innocent expression. Did you see how easily Kalin cut through the bigger tree? Richard frowned. Zed smiled. It could just as well have been iron. The blade would have cut through it the same. But you are stronger than she, and you couldn't even scratch the smaller tree. Yes, Zed, I noticed. Zed's brow wrinkled in mock bewilderment. And why do you think that is? Richard's irritation melted. This was the way Zed often taught lessons, by making him come up with the answer on his own. I would say it has something to do with intent. She thought the tree was evil, I didn't. Zed held up a bony finger. Very good, my boy. Kalen knitted her fingers together. Zed, I don't understand. I destroyed the tree, but it wasn't evil. It was innocent. 
That, dear one, is the point of the demonstration. Reality isn't relevant. Perception is everything. If you think it is the enemy, you can destroy it, whether true or not. The magic interprets only your perception. It won't allow you to harm someone you think innocent, but it will destroy whoever you perceive to be the enemy within limits. Only what you believe and not the truth of your thoughts is the determining factor. Richard was a little overwhelmed. That leaves no room for error. But what if you aren't sure? Zed lifted an eyebrow. You had better be sure, my boy, or you are liable to find yourself in a lot of trouble. The magic could read things in your mind you are not even aware of. It could go either way. You could kill a friend or fail to kill a foe. Richard drummed his fingers on the hilt of the sword, thinking. He watched the setting sun offer small golden flashes through the trees to the west. Overhead, the snake-like cloud had taken on a reddish cast on one side, deepening into darker purple on the other. It didn't really matter, he decided. He knew who he was after and there was no doubt at all in his mind about him being the enemy. None whatsoever. There's one more thing. One more important thing, the wizard said. When you use the sword against an enemy, there is a price to pay. Is that not true, dear one? He looked to her. Kalin nodded and lowered her eyes to the ground. The more powerful the enemy, the higher the price. I am sorry it was necessary to do that to you, Kalin, but it is the most important lesson Richard must learn. She gave him a small smile, letting him know that she understood the need. He turned back to Richard. We both know that sometimes killing is the only choice, that it has to be classified as the right thing to do. I know you do not need to be told that any time you kill, though, it is a terrible thing. You live with it always, and once done... It cannot be undone. You pay a price within yourself. It diminishes you for having done it. Richard nodded. It still made him uneasy that he had killed the man on Blunt Cliff. He wasn't sorry about what he had done. He had had no time or other choice. But in his mind, he still saw the man's face as he went over the edge. Zed's eyes became intense. It is different when you kill with the Sword of Truth because of the magic... The magic has done your bidding, and it extracts a price. There is no such thing as pure good or pure evil, least of all in people. In the best of us, there are thoughts or deeds that are wicked, and in the worst of us, at least some virtue. An adversary is not one who does loathsome acts for their own sake. He always has a reason that to him is justification. My cat eats mice. Does that make him bad? I don't think so, and the cat doesn't think so, but I would bet the mice have a different opinion. Every murderer thinks the victim needed killing. I know you don't want to believe this, Richard, but you must listen. Dark and Rahl does the things he does because he thinks them right, just as you do the things you do because you think them right. The two of you are more the same in that than you think. You want revenge on him for killing your father, and he wants revenge on me for killing his. In your eyes, he is evil. But to his eyes, you are the one who is evil. It is all just perception. Whoever wins thinks he was in the right. The loser will always believe himself wronged. It is the same as with the magic of Orden. The power is simply there. One use wins over the other the same? Have you lost your mind? How could you think we are the same in any way? He craves power. He would chance destroying the world to get it. I don't want power. I just wanted to be left alone. He murdered my father. He ripped his guts out. He's trying to kill us all. How can you say we are alike? You make it sound like he isn't even dangerous. Haven't you been paying attention to what I had just been teaching you? I said you are the same in that you both think you are right. And that makes him more dangerous than you can imagine. Because in every other way, you are different. Dark and Rahl savors bleeding the life from people. He hungers for their pain. Your sense of right has bounds. 
His has none. His is twisted into an all-consuming lust to torture all opposition into submission. And he considers any who don't rush to bow before him as opposition. His conscience was clear when he used his bare hands to calmly extract your father's guts while he was still breathing. He found pleasure in the doing because his distorted sense of right gives him license. That is how he is very different from you. That is how dangerous he is. He pointed back at Kalin. Weren't you paying attention? Didn't you see what she was able to do with the sword? And how did she do what you could not, hmm? Perception, Richard said in a much quieter voice. She was able to do it because she thought she was right. Zed thrust a finger in the air. Aha! Perception is what makes the threat even more dangerous. The wizard's finger came down and jabbed Richard's chest with each word. Just like the sword. Richard hooked a thumb under the baldric and let out a deep breath. He felt as if he were standing in quicksand, but he had lived with Zed too long to dismiss the things he said simply because they were hard to fathom. He longed for simplicity, though. You mean that it's not only what he does that makes him dangerous, but also what he feels justified in doing? Zed shrugged. Let me put it another way. Who would you be more afraid of? A 200-pound man who wants to steal a loaf of bread from you and knows he is doing wrong? Or a 100-pound woman who believes wrongly, but believes with all her heart that you stole her baby? Richard folded his arms across his chest. I would run from a woman. She wouldn't give up. She wouldn't listen to reason. She would be capable of anything. Zed's eyes were fierce. So is Dark and Raw. Because he thinks he is right. He is that much more dangerous. Richard returned the fierce expression. I am in the right. Zed's expression softened. The mice think they are in the right too, but my cat eats them just the same. I am trying to teach you something, Richard. I don't want you to get caught in his claws. Richard unfolded his arms and sighed. I don't like it, but I understand. As I have heard you say, nothing is ever easy. While all of this is interesting, it isn't going to frighten me away from doing what it is I must, what I believe to be right. So what is this business about a price to using the sword of truth? Zed held a thin finger to Richard's chest. The payment is that you suffer the pain of seeing in yourself all your own evil, all your own shortcomings, all the things we don't like to see in ourselves or admit are there. And you see the good in the one you have killed, suffer the guilt for having done so. Zed shook his head sadly. Please believe me, Richard, the pain comes not only from yourself, but more importantly from the magic, a very powerful magic. A very powerful pain. Do not underestimate it. It is real, and it punishes your body as well as your soul. You saw it in Kalen, and that was from killing a tree. If it had been a man, it would have been profound. This is why anger is so important. Rage is the only armor you have against the pain. It gives a measure of protection. The stronger the enemy, the stronger the pain. But the stronger the rage the stronger the shield. It makes you care less about the truth of what you have done. In some cases, enough to not feel the pain. This is why I said the terrible things I did to Kaelin, things that hurt and filled her with rage. It was to protect her when she used the sword. You see why I wouldn't have allowed you to take the sword if you weren't able to use your anger. You would be naked before the magic. It would tear you apart. Richard was a little frightened by this, by the look in Kalen's eyes after she had used the sword, but it didn't dissuade him. He glanced up at the mountains of the boundary. They stood out, pale pink in the light of the setting sun. Behind them, from the east, darkness was coming. Darkness coming for them. He had to find a way across the boundary into that darkness. The sword would help him. That was what mattered. There was much at stake. There was a cost to everything in life. He would pay this one. His old friend placed his hands on Richard's shoulders and looked hard into his eyes. 
Zed's features were set in grim warning. Now, I have to tell you something you are not going to like. His fingers tightened almost painfully. You cannot use the Sword of Truth on Dark and Rahal. What? Zed gave him a shake. He is too powerful. The magic of Orden protects him during his year of search. If you try to use the sword, you will be dead before it reaches him. This is crazy. First you want me to be the seeker and take the sword. Now you tell me I can't use it. Richard was furious. He felt cheated. Just against Raal. It won't work against him. Richard, I didn't make the magic. I only know how it works. Dark and Raal knows how it works, too. He may try to make you use the sword against him. He knows it will kill you. If you give in to the rage and use the sword against him, he will win. You will be dead and he will have the boxes. Kalin's brow wrinkled in frustration. Zed, I agree with Richard. This makes it impossible. If he cannot use his most important weapon, then... Zed cut her off. No! This! He rapped Richard on the head with his knuckles. This is a Seeker's most important weapon. He jabbed his long finger at the center of Richard's chest. And this. Everyone stood in silence for a moment. The Seeker is the weapon, Zed said with emphasis. The sword is just a tool. You can find another way. You must. Richard thought he should be upset, that he should feel angry, frustrated, overwhelmed, but he didn't. His first view of his options lifted from him, letting him see beyond. He felt strangely calm and determined. I'm sorry, my boy. I wish I could change the magic, but I... Richard put his hand on Zed's shoulder. It's all right, my friend. You're right. We must stop Rawl. That's all that matters. I have to know the truth to succeed, and you have given me the truth. Now it's up to me to use it. If we gain one of the boxes, justice will have Rawl. I don't need to see it. I need only know it is done. I said I wouldn't be an assassin, and so I shall not be. The sword will be invaluable, I'm sure, but as you said, it's only a tool, and that's the purpose I will put it to. The magic of the sword isn't an end in itself. I can't allow myself to make that mistake, or I will be only a pretend seeker. In the gathering gloom, Zed patted Richard affectionately on the shoulder. You have gotten it all right, my boy. All of it. He broke into a broad grin. I have chosen the Seeker well. I am proud of myself. Richard and Kalin laughed at Zed's self-congratulation. Kalin's smile faded. Zed, I cut down the tree you planted in memory of your wife. That bothers me. I'm deeply sorry for doing it. Don't be, dear one. Her memory has aided us. She has helped show the Seeker the truth. There could be no more fitting tribute to her. Richard didn't hear them talking. Already he was looking to the east, to the massive wall of mountains, trying to think of solutions. Cross the boundary, he thought. Cross the boundary without going through it. How? What if it was impossible? What if there was no way across the boundary? Would they be stuck here while Dark and Rawl searched for the boxes? Were they to die without a chance? He wished there were more time and fewer limitations. Richard reprimanded himself for wasting time wishing. If only he knew it could be done, then he could find out how. Something in the back of his mind nagged at him, insisting that it could be done, insisting he knew the truth of it. There was a way, there had to be. If he only knew that it was possible. All around them, the night was coming alive with sounds. Frogs called from the ponds and streams, Night birds from the trees and insects from the grass. From the distant hills came the cry of wolves, mournful and plaintive against the dark wall of mountains. Somehow they had to cross those mountains, cross the unknown. The mountains were like the boundary, he thought. You couldn't go through them, but you could cross them. You had only to find a pass. A pass. Was it possible? Could there be one? Then it struck him like a bolt of lightning. The book. Richard spun on his heels, excited. To his surprise, Zed and Kalin were both standing quietly, watching him, as if waiting for a pronouncement. Zed, 
Have you ever helped anyone other than yourself go through the boundary? Like who? Anyone, yes or no? No, no one. Can anyone other than a wizard send a person through the boundary? Zed shook his head emphatically. None but a wizard, and Dark and Rahl, of course. Richard frowned at him. Our lives depend on this, Zed. Swear. You have never, ever sent anyone other than yourself through the boundary. True? True as a boiling bog full of toasted toads. Why? What have you thought of? Do you have a way? Richard ignored the question too deep in his own stream of thought to answer, and instead turned back to the mountains. It was true. There was a pass across the boundary. His father had found it and used it. That was the only way the Book of Counted Shadows could have been in Westland. He couldn't have brought it with him when he moved here, before the boundary, and he couldn't have found it in Westland. The book had magic. The boundary wouldn't have worked if magic had been here then. Magic could only be brought into Westland after the boundary was up. His father had found a pass, gone into the Midlands, and brought the book back. Richard was shocked and excited at the same time. His father had done it. He had gone across the boundary. Richard was elated. Now he knew there was a way across. It could be done. He still had to find the pass. But that didn't matter for now. There was a pass. That was what mattered. Richard turned back to the other two. We will go have supper. I put a stew on just before you awoke, and there is fresh bread, Kalen offered. Bags! Zed threw his scarecrow arms up into the air. It's about time someone remembered supper. Richard gave a little smile in the dark. After we've eaten, we'll make preparations, decide what we need to take, what we can carry, get our provisions together and pack tonight. We'll need to get a good night's sleep. We leave at first light. He turned and headed for the house, the faint glow of the fire coming from the windows offered warmth and light. Zed held up an arm. Where are we headed, my boy? The Midlands, Richard called back over his shoulder. Zed was halfway through his second bowl of stew before he could bring himself to stop eating long enough to talk. So, what have you figured out? Is there truly a way to cross the boundary? There is. Are you sure? How can it be? How can we cross without going through? Richard smiled as he stirred his stew. You don't have to get wet to cross a river. The lamplight flickered on their faces as Kalen and Zed frowned in puzzlement. Kalen turned and threw a small piece of meat to the cat who was sitting on his haunches, waiting for any handout. Zed ate another slab of bread before he was able to ask his next question. And how do you know there is a way across? There is. That's all that matters. Zed had an innocent look on his face. Richard. He ate two more spoonfuls of stew. We are your friends. There are no secrets among us. You can tell us. Richard looked from one big pair of eyes to the other and laughed out loud. I've had strangers tell me more of themselves. Zed and Kalen both backed away a little at the rebuff and looked at each other, but neither dared repeat the question. They talked on as they ate, of what they had at hand to take with them, how much they could do to prepare in such a short time, and what their priorities should be. They listed everything they could think of, each offering items to be taken. There was much to do in little time. Richard asked Kaylin if she traveled the Midlands often. She said that was almost all she ever did. And you wear that dress when you travel? I do, she hesitated. People recognize me by it. I don't stay in the woods. Wherever I go, I am always provided with food and a place to stay and anything else I might require. Richard wondered why. He didn't press, but he knew the dress she wore was more than something she bought in a shop. Well, with the three of us being hunted, I don't think we want people to recognize you. I think we need to stay away from people as much as possible, keep to the woods when we can. She and Zed both nodded their agreement. We will need to find you some traveling clothes, forest garb, but there is nothing here that will fit you. We'll have to find something on the way. I have a hooded cloak here. It will keep you warm for now. Good, she said, smiling. I am tired of being cold, and I can tell you a dress is not right for the woods. Kaylin finished before the men and put her half-full bowl on the floor for the cat. 
The cat seemed to have the same appetite as Zed and was eating out of the bowl before she could set it down. They discussed each item they would take and planned how they would do without the others. There was no telling how long they would be gone, but Westland was a big place and the Midlands bigger. Richard wished they could go to his house, since he often went on long treks and had the right kinds of provisions, but it was too big a risk. He would rather find the things they needed elsewhere, or go without, than go back to what waited there. He didn't know yet where they were going to cross the boundary, but he wasn't worried. He still had until morning to think about it. He was just relieved to know there was a way. The cat's head came up. He crossed half the distance to the door and stopped, back and fur rising. Everyone noticed and fell silent. There was firelight in the front window, but it wasn't reflecting from the hearth. It was coming from outside. I smell burning pitch, Kalen said. In an instant, the three were on their feet. Richard grabbed the sword from the back of his chair and had it on almost before he was to his feet. He went to look out the window, but Zed didn't waste the time and went through the door in a rush with Kalen in tow. Richard got only a glimpse of torches before he hurried out after the other two. Spread out in the long grass in front of the house was a mob of about 50 men, some carrying torches, but most carrying crude weapons, axes, pitchforks, scythes, or axe handles. They were dressed in their work clothes. Richard recognized many of the faces, good men, honest, hard-working family men. They didn't look like good men this night, though. They looked to be in a foul mood, their faces grim and angry. Zed stood in the center of the porch, hands on his skinny hips, smiling out at them, the red light from the torches making his white hair pink. What's this then, boys? Zed asked. They mumbled among themselves, and several men in front took a step or two forward. Richard knew the one, John, who spoke for the rest. There's trouble about, trouble caused by magic, and you're at the bottom of it, old man. You're a witch. A witch? Zed asked in bewilderment. A witch? That's what I said, a witch. John's dark eyes shifted to Richard and Kalen. This doesn't concern you two. Our business is with the old man. Leave now or you'll get the same as him. Richard couldn't believe the men he knew were saying this. Kalen came forward, stepping in front of Zed, the folds of her dress swirling around her legs when she stopped. She held her fists at her sides. Leave now she warned menacingly, before you come to regret what you have chosen to do. The mob of men looked around at each other, some smirking, some making crude comments under their breath, some laughing. Kalen stood her ground and stared them down. The laughter died out. So, John said with a sneer, two witches to take care of. The men cheered and hollered, brandishing their weapons. John's round, heavy-set face smiled defiantly. Richard stepped slowly and deliberately in front of Kalen, putting a hand behind as he did so, forcing her and Zed to step back. He kept his voice calm, friendly. John, how's Sarah? I haven't seen you two for a while. John didn't answer. Richard surveyed the other faces. I know many of you. Know you to be good men. This isn't something you want to do. He looked back to John. Take your men and go home to your families. Please, John. John pointed an axe handle at Zed. That old man's a witch. We're going to put an end to him. He pointed at Kalen. And her. Unless you want the same, Richard, be on your way. The mob yelled their agreement. The torches sizzled and popped as they burned, and the air smelled of burning pitch and sweat. When they realized that Richard wasn't leaving, the rabble started to push forward. The sword was free in a blink. The men took a step back as the metallic ringing filled the night air. John stood in red-faced anger. The ringing died out, and the only sound was from the burning torches. Grumbling broke out about Richard being in with the witches. John charged, swinging the axe handle at Richard as he came. The sword flashed through the air, splintering John's weapon with a loud crack. Only two ragged inches of the axe handle were left above his fist. The severed piece of wood spun off into the darkness, landing somewhere with a hollow thud. John stood frozen, one foot on the ground, one on the porch, 
and the point of the sword of truth pressed to the underside of his ample chin. The polished blade glinted in the torchlight. Richard, his muscles hard with restrained need, slowly bent forward, and with the sword point tilted John's face up to his own. In a voice barely more than a whisper, but so deadly cold it made John stop breathing, he said, Another step, John, and your head follows. John didn't move, didn't breathe. Back away, Richard hissed. The man did as he was ordered, but when back with his fellows regained his nerve. You can't stop us, Richard. We're here to save our families. From what? Richard yelled. He pointed the sword at one of the other men. Frank, when your wife was sick, wasn't it Zed who brought her a potion that made her well? He pointed the sword to another. And Bill, didn't you come and ask Zed about the rains, when they would come so you fellows could harvest your crops? He whipped the sword's point back to his attacker. And John, when your little girl was lost in the woods, was it not Zed who read the clouds all night and then went out himself and found her and brought her back safe to you and Sarah? John and a few of the others cast their eyes downward. Richard angrily drove the sword back into its scabbard. Zed has helped most of the men here. He has helped heal your fevers, find lost loved ones, and freely shared anything he has with you. From the back, someone yelled out, Only a witch could do all those things! He has done nothing to harm a single one of you. Richard paced back and forth across the porch, facing the men down. He has never harmed one of you. He's helped most of you. Why would you want to harm a friend? There was some confused grumbling for a few minutes before they regained their conviction. Most of the things he's done are magic, John shouted. A witch's magic. None of our families are safe with him around. Before Richard could answer, Zed was pulling him back by his arm. He turned to the old man's smiling face. Zed didn't seem to be bothered in the least. If anything, he seemed to be enjoying himself. Very impressive, he whispered. Both of you, very impressive. If you would, though, let me handle it from here. He lifted an eyebrow, then turned to the men. Gentlemen, good evening. How nice to see you all. Some of the men gave a greeting in return. A few lifted their hats self-consciously. If you would be so kind before you dispatch me, let me talk a moment with my two friends here. There were nods all around. Zed pulled Kalin and Richard back a little toward the house, away from the crowd, and bent close. A lesson in power, my friends. He put a stick-like finger on Kalin's nose. Too little. Next, he put the finger on Richard's nose. Too much. He put the finger to his own nose and with a twinkle in his eyes said, Just right. He cupped Kalin's chin in his hand. If I were to let you do this, dear one, there would be graves to be dug this night. Our three would be among them. But very noble, nonetheless. Thank you for your concern for me. He put his hand on Richard's shoulder. If I were to let you do this, there would be a great many graves to be dug, and the three of us would be the only ones left to do the digging. I am too old to dig that many holes in the ground, and we have more important things to do. But you were very noble, too. You handled yourself honorably. He patted Richard's shoulder, and then put a finger under each of their chins. Now, I want you two to let me handle this matter. The problem is not what you are telling these men. The problem is they aren't listening. You have to get their attention before they will hear you. He lifted an eyebrow and looked to each in turn. Watch and learn what you can. Listen to my words. But they will have no effect on you. He removed his finger and shuffled past them, smiling and waving to the men. Gentlemen! Oh, John, how is your little girl? She's fine, he grumbled. But one of my cows had a two-headed calf. Really? And how do you think that happened? I think it happened because you're a witch. There, you said it again. Zed shook his head in confusion. I don't understand. Do you gentlemen want to do away with me because you think I have magic? Or is it simply your intention to demean me by calling me a woman? There was some confusion. We don't know what you're talking about, someone said. Well, it's simple. Girls are witches. Boys are called warlocks. Do you see my point? If you call me a witch, you seem to be calling me a girl. If what you mean is that you think me a warlock, well, that is an altogether different insult. 
So which is it, girl or warlock? There was more confused discussion, then John spoke up angry. We mean to say you're a warlock and we intend to have your hide for it. My, 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 Zed said, tapping his lower lip thoughtfully with the tip of his finger. Why, I had no idea you men were so brave. So very brave indeed. How's that? John asked. Zed shrugged. Well, what is it you think a warlock capable of? There was more talk among themselves. They started shouting out suggestions. He could make two-headed cows, make the rains come, find people who were lost, make children be stillborn, make strong men weak, and make their women leave them. Somehow this didn't seem to be sufficient, so more ideas were shouted out. Make water burn, turn people into cripples, change a man into a toad, kill with a look, call upon demons, and in general everything else. Zed waited until they were done, and then held his arms out to them. There, you have it. Just as I said. You men are the bravest fellows I have ever seen. To think, armed only with pitchforks and axe handles, you came to do battle with a warlock who has these kinds of powers. My, my, how brave. His voice trailed off. Zed shook his head in wonderment. Worry started to break out in the crowd. Zed went on in a drawn-out, monotonous tone, suggesting the things a warlock could do, describing in great detail a variety of deeds from the frivolous to the terrifying. The men stood, transfixed, listening in rapt attention. He went on and on for a good half hour. Richard and Kalen listened, shifting their weight as they became bored and tired. The eyes of the mob were wide, unblinking. They stood like statues, the dancing flames from their torches the only motion among the men. The mood had changed. There was no longer anger. Now there was fear. The wizard's voice changed, too. No longer kind and gentle or even dull. It was hard. Threatening. And so, men, what do you think it is we should do now? We think you should let us go home unharmed, came the weak reply. The others nodded their agreement. The wizard waggled a long finger in the air in front of them. No, I don't think so. You see, you men came here to kill me. My life is the most precious thing I have, and you intended to take it from me. I can't let that go unpunished. Quaking and fear swept through the crowd. Zed stepped to the edge of the porch. The men took a step back. As punishment for trying to take my life, I take from you not your life, but that which is most precious, most dear, most valuable. With a flourish, he swept his hand dramatically over their heads. They gasped. There! It is done, he declared. Richard and Kalen, who had been leaning against the house, stood up straight. For a moment, no one moved. Then a fellow in the midst of the mob thrust his hand into his pocket and felt around. My gold, it's gone! Zed rolled his eyes. No, 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 I said the most precious, the most dear, that which you pride above all else. Everyone stood a moment, confused. Then a few eyebrows went up in alarm. Another man suddenly thrust his hand into his pocket and felt around, eyes wide in fright. He moaned and then fainted. The ones nearby drew back from him. Soon others were putting their hands in their pockets, cautiously feeling around. There were more moans and wails, and soon all the men were grabbing at their crotches in a panic. Zed smiled in satisfaction. Pandemonium broke out among the mob. Men were jumping up and down, crying, grabbing at themselves, running around in little circles, asking for help, falling on the ground and sobbing. Now, you men get out of here. Leave, Zed yelled. He turned to Richard and Kalen. An impish grin on his face wrinkled his nose. He winked at them both. Please, Zed, a few men called out. Please don't leave us like this. Please help us. There were pleas all around. Zed waited a few moments and turned back to them. What's this? Do you men think I have been too harsh? He asked with mock wonder and sincerity. There was quick agreement that he had been. 
And why do you think this? Have you learned something? Yes, John yelled. We realize now that Richard was right. You have been our friend. You have never done anything to harm any of us. Everyone shouted their agreement. You have only helped us, and we acted stupidly. We want to ask your forgiveness. We know, just like Richard said, that we were wrong, that using magic doesn't make you bad. Please, Ed, don't stop being our friend now. Please don't leave us like this. There were more pleas shouted out. Zed tapped a finger on his bottom lip. Well, he looked up thinking. I guess I could put things back to the way they were. The men moved closer. But only if you agree to my terms. I think them quite fair, though. They were ready to agree to anything. All right. Then if you agree to tell anyone who speaks up from now on that magic doesn't make a person bad, that their actions are what count, and if you go home to your families and tell them you almost made a terrible mistake tonight and why you were wrong, then you will all be restored. Fair? There was nodding from everyone. More than fair, John said. Thank you, Zed. The men turned and began to leave quickly. Zed stood and watched. Oh, gentlemen, one more thing. They froze. Please pick up your tools from the ground. I'm an old man. I could easily trip and hurt myself. They kept a cautious eye to him as they reached out and snatched up their weapons. They turned and walked a ways before breaking into a run. Richard came and waited to one side of Zed, Kalen to the other. Zed stood with his hands on his bony hips watching the men go. Idiots, he muttered under his breath. It was dark. The only light came from the front window of the house behind them, and Richard could barely see Zed's face, but he could see it well enough to see he wasn't smiling. My friends, the old man said, that was a stew stirred by a hidden hand. Zed, Kalen asked, diverting her eyes from his face. Did you really make, well, you know, make their manhood vanish? Zed chuckled. That would be quite the magic. Beyond me, I'm afraid. No, dear one, I only tricked them into thinking I had. Simply convinced them of the truth of it. Let their own minds do the work. Richard turned to the wizard. A trick? It was just a trick? I thought you had done real magic. He seemed somehow disappointed. Zed shrugged. Sometimes. If a trick is done properly, it can work better than magic. In fact, I would go so far as to say a good trick is real magic. But still, it was just a trick. The wizard held up a finger. Results, Richard, that's what counts. Your way, those men would have all lost their heads, Richard grinned. Zed, I think some of them would have preferred that over what you did to them. Zed chuckled. So, is that what you wanted us to watch and learn? That a trick can work as well as magic? Yes, but also something more important. As I said, this was a stew stirred by a hidden hand, the hand of Dark and Rahl. But he has made a mistake tonight. It is a mistake to use insufficient force to finish the job. In so doing, you give your enemy a second chance. That is the lesson I want you to learn. Learn it well. You may not get a second chance when your time comes. Richard frowned. I wonder why he did it then, Zed shrugged. I don't know. Maybe because he doesn't have enough power in this land yet. But then it also was a mistake to try, because it only served to warn us. They started toward the door. There was a lot of work to do before they could sleep. Richard began going through the list in his head, but was distracted by an odd feeling. Suddenly, realization washed over him like cold water. Richard inhaled in a gasp. He spun around, eyes wide, and grabbed a fistful of Zed's robes. We have to get out of here, right now. What? Zed. Dark and Rawl isn't stupid. He wants us to feel safe, to feel confident. He knew we were smart enough to beat those men one way or another. In fact, he wanted us to. So we would sit around congratulating ourselves while he comes for us himself. He doesn't fear you. You said he's stronger than a wizard. He doesn't fear the sword, and he doesn't fear Kalin. He's on his way here right now. His plan is to get us all at the same time right now this very night. 
He hasn't made a mistake. This was his plan. You said it yourself. Sometimes a trick is better than magic. That's what he's doing. This was all a trick to distract us. Kalin's face went white. Zed, Richard is right. This is how Rawl thinks. The mark of his way. He likes to do things in a manner you do not expect. We have to get out of here this very minute. Bags, I have been an old fool. You are right. We must leave now, but I can't leave without my rock. He started off around the house. Zed, there's no time. The old man was already running up the hill, robes and hair flying off into the darkness. Kalin followed Richard into the house. They had been lulled into laziness. He couldn't believe how foolish he had been to underestimate Rawl. Snatching up his pack from the corner by the hearth, he ran into his room, checking under his shirt for the tooth. Finding it safe, he came back with his forest cloak. Richard threw it around Kalin's shoulders and took a quick glance around to see if there was anything else he could grab. But there was no time to think, nothing worth their lives, so he took her by the arm and headed for the door. Outside in the grass in front of the house, Zed was already back, breathing hard. What about the rock? Richard asked. There was no way Zed could lift it, much less carry it. In my pocket, the wizard said it with a smile. Richard couldn't spare the time to wonder at this. The cat was suddenly there, somehow aware of their urgency, rubbing up against their legs. Zed picked it up. Can't leave you here, cat. There's trouble coming. Zed lifted the flap of Richard's pack and tucked the cat inside. Richard had an uneasy feeling. He looked about, scanning the darkness, seeking something out of place, something hidden. He saw nothing, but felt eyes watching. Kalin noticed his searching. What's wrong? Even though he could see nothing, he felt the eyes. It must be his fear, he decided. Nothing. Let's go. Richard led them through a sparsely wooded area he knew well enough to walk blindfolded to the trail he wanted and turned south. They moved along quickly in silence, with the exception of Zed muttering occasionally about how stupid he had been. After a while, Kalin told him he was too reproachful of himself. They had all been fooled, and each felt the sting of blame. But they had made good their escape, and that was all that mattered. It was an easy trail, almost a road, and the company of three walked side by side, Richard in the middle, Zed to his left, Kalin to his right. The cat poked his head up from Richard's backpack and looked about as they walked. It was a mode of travel he had enjoyed since he was a kitten. The moonlight was enough to light their way. Richard saw a few wayward pines looming against the sky, but he knew there could be no stopping. They had to get away from here. The night was cold, but he was warm enough with the effort of their rapid pace. Kalin wrapped his cloak tightly around herself. After about a half hour, Zed brought them to a halt. He reached into his robes and pulled out a small handful of powder. He threw it back down the path the way they had come. Silver sparkles shot from his hand and followed their trail back into the darkness. The sparkles tinkled as they went, disappearing around a bend. Richard started back up the trail. What was that? Just a little magic dust. It will cover our trail so Rawl won't know where we went. He still has the cloud to follow us with. Yes, but that will only give him a general area. If we keep moving, it will be of little use to him. It's only when you stop, like you did in my house, that he can hunt you. They continued on to the south, the trail taking them through sweet-smelling pines and higher into the hill country. At the top of a rise, they all turned suddenly at a roaring sound behind. Off beyond the dark expanse of the forest, in the distance, they saw an immense column of flame shooting skyward, yellows and reds reaching up into the blackness. It's my house. Dark and Rawl is there, Zed smiled. He looks to be angry. Kalin touched his shoulder. I'm sorry, Zed. Don't be, dear one. It's just an old house. It could have been us. Kalin turned to Richard as they started out again. Do you know where we are going? Richard abruptly realized he did. I do. He smiled to himself, glad to be telling the truth. The three figures fled into the dark shadows of the trail into the night. Overhead, two huge winged beasts watched with hungry, glowing green eyes and then pitched themselves into steep, silent dives. Wings tucked back for speed, they plummeted toward the backs of their prey. Chapter 11 It was the cat that saved him. He yowled and leapt over Richard's head in a fright, causing him to duck, 
Not enough for the guard to miss him, but enough to deflect the full impact. Still, the claws raked his back painfully and knocked him sprawling face down into the dirt, driving the wind from his lungs in a whoosh. Before he could take a breath, the gar pounced on his back, its weight preventing him from breathing or reaching his sword. Before he went down, he had seen Zed sent tumbling into the trees by a second gar, and now it went crashing through the brush after him. Richard braced himself for the claws he knew would come. Before the gar could rip him open, Kalin heaved rocks at it from the side of the path. They bounced harmlessly off the beast's head, but it was distracted momentarily. The gar roared, mouth agape, seeming to split the night air with the sound, and held him pinned like a mouse beneath a cat's paw. Richard struggled mightily to lift himself, his lungs burning for air. Blood flies bit his neck. He reached behind, pulling out handfuls of fur, trying to get the great arm off his back. By its size, he knew it had to be a short-tailed gar. It was much bigger than the long-tailed gar he had seen before. The sword was under him, digging painfully into his abdomen. He couldn't get to it. He felt as if the veins in his neck would burst. Richard was beginning to black out. The sounds of yelling and roars from the gar were growing fainter as he struggled. Kalin got too close in her flurry of rock-throwing. The gar reached out with frightening quickness and snatched her by the hair. Doing so caused the beast to shift his weight enough to let Richard gasp desperately for air, but not enough to allow him to move. Kalin screamed. Out of nowhere, the cat, all teeth and claws, sprang to the gar's face. The cat howled, clawing furiously at the gar's eyes. With one arm holding Kalin, it lifted the other to swipe at the cat. When it did, Richard rolled to the side and sprang to his feet, drawing his sword. Kalin screamed again. Richard swung in fury, severing the arm that held her. She tumbled back, free. Howling, the gar backhanding him before he could bring the sword up. The force of the blow sent him flying through the air, landing on his back. Richard sat up, the world spinning and tilting. The sword was gone, thrown into the brush somewhere. The gar was in the center of the trail, wailing in pain and rage as blood gushed from the stump. Glowing green eyes searched frantically for the object of its hate. They locked on Richard. He didn't see Kalin anywhere. Off to his right in the trees there was a sudden blinding flash illuminating everything with intense white light. The violent sound of an explosion hammered painfully into his ears as the concussion from the blast tumbled him against a tree and knocked the gar from its feet. Rolling flames whirled through gaps in the trees. Giant splinters and other debris hurtled past, streaming trailers of smoke. Richard began a frantic search for the sword as the gar came to its feet with a howl. Richard felt around on the ground, desperate, and partially blinded from the flash of the explosion. He had enough vision, though, to see the gar coming. His anger flared. He could feel it flare in the sword, too. The sword's magic reached out to him, beckoned by its master. He called it forth, summoned it, hungered for it. It was there across the trail. He knew it as surely as if he could see it. He knew exactly where it lay as if he were touching it. He scrambled across the trail. Halfway there, the gar kicked him so hard he saw things moving past but couldn't understand what they were. All he knew for sure was that every breath caused intense pain in his left side. He didn't know where the trail was or where he was in relation to it. Blood flies were bumping into his face. He couldn't get his bearings, but he did know where the Sword of Truth was. He dove for it. For an instant, his fingers touched it. For an instant, he thought he saw Zed. Then the gar had him. It picked him up by his right arm and wrapped its repulsive warm wings around him, hugging him close, his feet dangling in midair. He cried out from the sharp pain in his left ribs. Glowing green eyes burned into his, and the giant mouth snapped, showing him his fate. The immense maw split open for him, its fetid breath on his face, its black throat waiting. Wet fangs glistened in the moonlight. With all his strength, Richard kicked his boot into the stump of the gar's arm. It threw its head back, howled in pain, and dropped him. Zed emerged at the edge of the trees a dozen yards behind the gar. Richard, on his knees, grabbed the sword. Zed threw his hands out, fingers extended. Fire, wizard's fire, shot from his fingers and came shrieking through the air. The fire grew and tumbled, illuminating everything it passed, becoming a blue and yellow ball of liquid flame that wailed and expanded as it came, a thing alive. 
It hit the guard's back with a thud, silhouetting the giant beast against the light. Within the space of a breath, the blue and yellow flames washed over the gar, enveloping it, surging through it. Blood flies sparked into nothingness. Fire sizzled and snapped everywhere on the creature, consuming it. The gar disappeared into the blue heat and was gone. The fire swirled a moment, and then it too was gone. The smell of burnt fur and a hazy smoke hung in the air. The night was suddenly quiet. Richard collapsed, exhausted and in pain. The gashes on his back had dirt and gravel ground into them, and the pain in his left side seared into him with every breath. He wanted only to lie there, nothing more. The sword was still in his hand. He let the power of it wash through him, sustain him. He allowed the anger of it to let him ignore the pain. The cat licked Richard's face with his rough tongue and nuzzled the top of his head against Richard's cheek. Thank you, cat, he managed. Zed and Kalin appeared over him. Both bent down to take his arms and help lift him up. No, you'll hurt me if you do that. Let me get up by myself. What's wrong? Zed asked. The gar kicked me in the left side. It hurts. Let me look. The old man bent over and gently felt Richard's ribs. Richard winced in pain. Well, I don't see any bones sticking out. Can't be that bad. Richard tried not to laugh, as he knew it would hurt. He was right. Zed... That was no trick. This time it was magic. This time it was magic, the wizard confirmed. But Dark and Rahl may have seen it too if he was looking. We have to get out of here. Lie still. Let me see if I can help. Kalin knelt on his other side and cupped her hand on his, on the hand that held the sword, held the magic. When her hand touched his, he felt a surge of power from the sword that startled him and nearly took his breath away. Somehow... He felt the magic was warning him and trying to protect him. Kalin smiled down at him. She hadn't felt it. Zed put one hand on Richard's ribs and a finger under his chin as he spoke in a soft, calm, reassuring voice. As he listened to Zed, Richard dismissed the sword's reaction to Kalin's touch on his hand. His old friend told him that three of his ribs were injured and that he was putting magic around them to strengthen and protect them until they could heal. He continued to talk in his special way, telling Richard how the pain would be reduced but not gone until the ribs were healed. He spoke more, but the words seemed somehow not to matter. When Zed finished at last, Richard felt as if he were waking from sleep. He sat up. The pain had lessened greatly. He thanked the old man and got to his feet. He put the sword away and picked up the cat, thanking him again. He handed the cat to Kalin for her to hold while he searched for his pack and found it near the side of the trail where it had been thrown in the fight. The gashes on his back were painful, but he would worry about them when they got to where they were going. When the other two weren't looking, he slipped the tooth from his neck and put it in his pocket. Richard asked the other two if they were hurt. Zed seemed insulted by the question. He insisted he wasn't as frail as he looked. Kalin said she was fine thanks to him. Richard told her he hoped never to get in a rock-throwing contest with her. She gave him a big smile as she put Cat in his backpack. He watched as she picked up the cloak and put it around her shoulders, wondering at the way the sword's magic had reacted when she had touched his hand. We had better be leaving, Zed reminded them. After about a mile, several smaller paths intersected theirs. Richard led them down the one he wanted. The wizard spread more of his magic dust to hide their trail. Their way was narrower now, so they walked single file, with Richard in the lead, Kalin in the middle, and Zed in the rear. The three of them kept a wary eye to the sky as they walked along. Even though it was uncomfortable to do so, Richard walked with his hand on the hilt of the sword. Shadows in the moonlight swept back and forth across the heavy oak door and its iron strap hinges as the wind bowed branches close to the house. Kalin and Zed didn't want to climb the spiked fence, so Richard had left them on the other side to wait. He was just starting to reach up to knock on the door when a big fist grabbed his hair and a knife pressed against his throat. He froze. Chase? He whispered hopefully. The hand released his hair. Richard! What are you doing lurking about in the middle of the night? You know better than to sneak up to my place. I wasn't sneaking. I didn't want to wake the whole house. There's blood all over you. How much is yours? Most of it, I'm sorry to say. Chase, go unlock your gate. Kalin and Zed are waiting out there. We need you. 
Chase, cursing as he stepped on twigs and acorns with his bare feet, unlocked the gate and shepherded them all into the house. Emma Branstone, Chase's wife, was a kind, friendly woman, always wearing a smile on her bright face. She seemed the complete opposite of Chase. Emma would be mortified if she thought she had intimidated anyone, while Chase's day wouldn't be complete unless he had. Emma was like Chase in one respect, though. Nothing ever seemed to surprise or fluster her. She was typically unruffled at this late hour as she stood in her long white nightdress, her gray streaked hair tied back, making tea as the rest of them sat at the table. She smiled as if it were normal to have blood streaked guests come visiting in the middle of the night. But then with Chase, it sometimes was. Richard hung his pack over the back of his chair, taking the cat out and handing him to Kaylin. She put him in her lap, where he immediately began purring as she stroked his back. Zed sat to his other side. Chase put a shirt on over his big frame and lit several lamps that hung from heavy oak beams. Chase had felled the trees, hewed the beams out, and placed them by himself. The names of the children were carved along the side of one. Behind his chair at the table was a fireplace made of stones he had collected in his travels over the years. Each had a unique shape, color, and texture. Chase would tell anyone who would listen where each had come from and what sort of trouble he had encountered in retrieving it. A simple wooden bowl full of apples sat in the center of the stout pine table. Emma removed the bowl of apples and replaced it with a pot of tea and a jar of honey, then passed around mugs. She told Richard to remove his shirt and turn his chair so she could clean his wounds, a task not unfamiliar to her. With a stiff brush and hot soapy water, she scrubbed his back as if she were cleaning a dirty kettle. Richard bit his bottom lip, holding his breath at times, and scrunched his eyes closed in pain as she worked. She apologized for hurting him, but said she had to get all the dirt out or it would be worse later. When she was finished cleaning the gashes, she patted his back dry with a towel and applied a cool salve while Chase got him a clean shirt. Richard was glad to put the shirt on, as it provided him at least a symbol of protection from her further ministering. Emma smiled to the three guests. Would anyone like something to eat? Zed lifted a hand. Well, I wouldn't mind... Richard and Kalen both shot him a withering glare. He shrank back into his chair. No, nothing for us, thank you. Emma stood behind Chase, combing her fingers affectionately through his hair. He sat in undisguised agony, barely able to tolerate her public display of sentiment. At last, he leaned forward, using the excuse of pouring tea to put a stop to it. With a frown, Chase pushed the honey across the table. Richard, for as long as I've known you, you've had a talent for sidestepping trouble. But lately, you seem to be losing your footing. Before Richard could answer, Lee, one of their daughters, appeared in the doorway, rubbing her sleepy eyes with her fists. Chase scowled at her. She pouted back. Chase sighed. You've got to be the ugliest child I've ever seen. Her pout turned to a beaming grin. Lee ran over to him, threw her arms around his leg, put her head on his knee, and hugged it tight. He mussed her hair. Back to bed with you, little one. Wait, Zed spoke up. Lee, come here. She went around the table. My old cat has been complaining that he has no children to play with. Lee stole a peek toward Kalen's lap. Do you know of any children he could visit? The girl's eyes widened. Said he could stay here. He would have fun with us. Really? Well, then, he will stay here for a visit. All right, Lee, Emma said. Off to bed with you. Richard looked up. Emma, could you do me a favor? Do you have any traveling clothes Kalen could borrow? Emma looked Kalen over. Well, her shoulders are too big for my clothes, and her legs are too long, but the older girls have things I think would work nicely. She smiled warmly at Kalen and held out a hand. Come on, dear, let's see what we can find. Kalen handed Cat to Lee and took her other hand. I hope Cat won't be a bother. He insists on sleeping on your bed with you. Oh, no, Lee said earnestly. That will be fine. As they left the room, Emma knowingly shut the door. Chase took a sip of tea. Well? Well, you know the conspiracy my brother was talking about? It's worse than he knows. That's so, Chase said noncommittally. 
Richard pulled the Sword of Truth from its scabbard and laid it on the table between them. The polished blade gleamed. Chase leaned forward and put his elbows on the table, lifting the sword with his fingertips. He let it roll into his palms, inspecting it closely, running his fingers over the word truth on the hilt, and down the fuller on each side of the blade, testing the sharpness of the edge. He betrayed nothing more than mild curiosity. Not unusual for a sword to be named, but typically the name is engraved on the blade. I've never seen the name put on the hilt. Chase was waiting for someone else to say something consequential. Chase, you've seen this sword before, Richard admonished. You know what it is. I have, but I've never seen it this close. His eyes came up, dark and intense. The point is, Richard, what are you doing with it? Richard peered back with equal intensity. It was given to me by a great and noble wizard. Chase's forehead wrinkled into a sober frown. He looked to Zed. What's your part in this, Zed? Zed leaned forward, a small smile on his thin lips. I'm the one who gave it to him. Chase leaned back in his chair, shaking his head slowly. The spirits be praised, he whispered. A real seeker, at last. We don't have much time, Richard said. I need to know some things about the boundary. Chase let out a deep sigh as he rose and went to the hearth. He leaned an arm on the mantel, staring into the flames. The other two waited while the big man picked at the rough wood of the mantel as if trying to pick his words. Richard, do you know what my job is? Richard shrugged. Keeping people away from the boundary for their own good? Chase shook his head. Do you know how to get rid of wolves? Go out and hunt them, I guess. The boundary warden shook his head again. That might get a few, but more would be born. And in the end, you have just as many. If you really want to have fewer wolves, you hunt their food. You trap rabbits, so to speak. It's easier. If there is less food, fewer pups will be born. In the end, you have fewer wolves. That's my job. I hunt rabbits. Richard felt a wave of fright ripple through him. Most people don't understand the boundary or what we do. They think it's just some stupid law we enforce. Many are afraid of the boundary, mostly older people. Many others think they know what's best and go up there to poach. They aren't afraid of the boundary, so we make them afraid of the wardens. That's something real to them, and we keep it real. They don't like it, but out of fear of us, they stay away. To a few, it's a game, to see if they can get away with it. We don't expect to catch them all. We don't really care. What we care about is scaring enough of them so the wolves in the boundary won't have enough rabbits to get stronger. We protect the people, but not by preventing them from going into the boundary. Anyone stupid enough to do that is beyond our help. Our job is to keep most away, keep the boundary weak enough so the things in there can't come out and get everyone else. The wardens have all seen things that have gotten loose. We all understand, others don't. Lately, more and more things have been getting loose. Page 115. Your brother's government may pay us, but they don't understand either. Our allegiance is not to them, nor to any rule of law. Our only duty is to protect the people from the things that come out of the darkness. We consider ourselves sovereign. We take orders when it doesn't hinder our job. It keeps matters friendly. But if the time ever comes, well, we follow our own cause, our own orders. He sat back at the table, leaning forward on his elbows. Ultimately... There is only one whose orders we will follow, because our cause is a part of his larger cause. That one is the true seeker. He picked up the sword in his big hands and held it out to Richard, looking him in the eyes. I pledge my life and loyalty to the seeker. Richard sat back, moved. Thank you, Chase. He looked to the wizard a moment, then back to the boundary warden. Now we'll tell you what's been going on, and then I'll tell you what I want. Richard and Zed both shared in the telling of all that had happened. Richard wanted Chase to know it all, to understand that there could be no half-efforts, 
that it had to be victory or death, not by their choice, but by Dark and Rawls. Chase looked from one to the other as they spoke, understanding the seriousness of what they were telling him, appearing grim at the telling of the story of the magic of Orden. They didn't have to convince him of the truth of it. He was a man who had seen more than they would probably ever know. He asked few questions and listened carefully. He did enjoy the story of what Zed had done to the mob. His booming laugh filled the room until his laughter dissolved in tears. The door opened, and Kalin and Emma stepped into the light. Kalin was outfitted in fine forest garb, dark green pants with a wide belt, tan shirt, dark cloak, and a good pack. The boots and waist pouch were her own. She looked ready to live a life in the woods. Still, her hair, her face, her figure, and mostly her bearing, spoke that she was more. Richard introduced her to Chase. My guide. Chase lifted an eyebrow. Emma saw the sword, and by her expression, Richard knew she understood. She moved behind her husband again, not touching his hair, but simply resting a hand on his shoulder, wanting to be near him. She knew trouble visited this night. Richard sheathed the sword, and Kalin came and sat next to him as he finished relating the news of the events of the night. When he was done, they all sat in silence for a few minutes. What can I do to help you, Richard? Chase finally asked. Richard spoke softly, but firmly. Tell me where the pass is. Chase's eyes came up sharply. What pass? His old defensiveness was still in evidence. The pass across the boundary. I know about it, I just don't know exactly where it is, and I don't have time to search. Richard didn't have time to play these games and felt his anger rising. Who told you this? Chase, answer the question. The other smiled a little. One condition. I take you there. Richard thought about the children. Chase was used to danger, but this was different. That isn't necessary. Chase gave Richard an appraising look. It is to me. It's a dangerous place. You three don't know what you're getting yourselves into. I won't send you there alone, and the boundary is my responsibility. If you want me to tell you, then I'm going. Everyone waited while Richard considered this a moment. Chase didn't bluff, and time was dear. Richard had no choice. Chase, we would be honored to have you with us. Good. He slapped his hand on the table. The pass is called the King's Port. It's in a foul place called South Haven. Four, maybe five days' ride on horseback, if we take Hawker's trail. Since you're in a hurry, that's the way you'll want to be going. It will be light in a few hours. The three of you need to get some sleep. Emma and I will get the provisions together. Chapter 12 It seemed that he had just fallen asleep when Emma woke him and led them down to breakfast. The sun wasn't up yet, nor was anyone else in the house, but roosters were already crowing at the lightening of the new day. The aromas of cooking made him instantly hungry. Emma, smiling, but not as brightly as the night before, dished out a big breakfast and said Chase had already eaten and was loading the horses. Richard had always thought Kaylin looked alluring in her unusual dress. He decided her new outfit didn't lessen her appeal in the least. While Kaylin and Emma talked about the children and Zed gushed compliments about the food, Richard's mind fretted on what lay ahead. The light dimmed a little as Chase's form filled the doorway. Kaylin gave a start when she saw him. He was wearing a chainmail shirt over a tan leather tunic, heavy black pants, boots, and cloak. Black gauntlets were tucked behind a wide black belt with a large silver buckle emblazoned with the emblem of the Boundary Wardens. Strapped everywhere were enough armaments to outfit a small army. On an ordinary man, the effect would have been silly. On Chase, it was frightening. He was an image of overt threat, deadly with every weapon he carried. Chase had two basic expressions he wore most of the time. The first, a look of feigned, ignorant disinterest. The second, one that made him seem as if he was about to participate in a slaughter. He wore the second this day. On their way out, Emma handed Zed a bundle. Fried chicken, she said. He gave her a big grin and kissed her forehead. Kalen gave her a hug and promised to see that the clothes were returned. Richard bent and gave Emma a warm embrace. Be careful, she whispered in his ear. She gave her husband a kiss on the cheek that he accepted graciously. Chase handed Kalen a sheathed long knife 
telling her to wear it at all times. Richard asked if he could borrow a knife, too, as he had left his home. Chase's fingers deftly found the strap he wanted among the tangle, freed it, and handed a knife to Richard. Kalen eyed all the weaponry. Do you think you will need all those? He gave her a crooked smile. If I didn't take them, I know I would. The small company, Chase leading, followed by Zed, then Kalen, with Richard bringing up the rear, settled into a comfortable pace through the Heartland Woods. It was a bright autumn morning with a chill to the air. A hawk wheeled in the sky over their heads, a sign of warning at the beginning of a journey. Richard thought to himself that the sign was totally unnecessary. By mid-morning, they had left the Heartland Valley and passed into the upper Venn Forest, joining Hawker's Trail below Trunt Lake and turned south with the snake-like cloud in slow pursuit. Richard was glad to be leading it away from Chase's house and children. He was troubled that they had to travel so far to the south to cross the boundary, for time was dear. But Chase had said that if there was another pass, he didn't know about it. Hardwood forests gave way to stands of ancient pines. Passing among them was like traveling through a canyon. The trunks soared to dizzying heights before the limbs branched out, and Richard felt small in the deep shade of the old trees. He had always been at ease traveling. He did it often, and the familiar places they passed made it seem to be just another trek, but this trip was not the same. They were going places he had never been, dangerous places. Chase was concerned and had warned them. This alone gave Richard pause, for Chase was not a man to worry over nothing. In fact, Richard had often thought he worried far too little. Richard watched the other three as they rode. Chase, a black wraith upon his horse, armed to the teeth, feared by the people he protected as well as the ones he hunted, but somehow not by children. The wisp of a wizard stick like Zed, unassuming, hardly more than a smile, white hair and simple robes, content to carry nothing more than a bundle of fried chicken, but wielder of wizard's fire, and who knew what else. And Kalen, courageous, determined, and keeper of some secret power, sent to threaten a wizard into naming the seeker. The three of them were his friends, yet each in their own way made him uneasy. He wondered who was more dangerous. They followed him unquestioningly, yet led him at the same time. The three of them all sworn to protect the seeker with their lives, and yet none of the small company, singly or together, was a match for Dark and Rawl. The whole of their task seemed hopeless. Zed was already into the chicken. Periodically, he would toss a bone over his shoulder. After a while, he thought to offer a piece to the others. Chase declined as he kept up a continual scan of their surroundings, paying particular attention to the left side of the trail, to the boundary. The other two accepted. The chicken had lasted longer than Richard thought it would. When the trail widened, he brought his horse up with Kalins and rode next to her. She took off her cloak as the day warmed and smiled over to him with the special smile she never gave anyone else. Richard had a thought. Zed, is there anything a wizard can do about that cloud? The old man squinted up at it, then peered back at Richard. That idea has already come into my head. I think there might be, but I want to wait a while longer until we are farther away from Chase's family. I don't want to lead a search to them. In the late afternoon, they came upon an old couple, woods people whom Chase knew. The four brought their horses to a halt while the boundary warden spoke with the couple. He sat relaxed on his mount, leather creaking, as he listened to them repeat rumors that they had heard about things coming out of the boundary. Richard now knew them to be more than rumors. Chase treated the couple with respect, as he did most people. Nevertheless, they were clearly afraid of him. He told them he was looking into the matter and advised them to stay inside at night. They rode until long after dark before making camp for the night in a stand of pine and were on their way the next morning as the sky lightened behind the mountains of the boundary. Richard and Kalen both yawned as they rode. The forest thinned with open patches of meadow, bright and green and smelling sweet in the sunshine as they traveled through the hill country on their journey south, the road taking them temporarily farther from the mountains of the boundary. Occasionally, they passed small farms, their owners making themselves scarce when they saw Chase. The land became less familiar to Richard, who rarely traveled this far south. He kept a sharp lookout, making note of the landmarks they passed. After they ate a cold lunch in the warm sun, 
the road began angling steadily closer to the mountains until in the late afternoon they were so close to the boundary that they began encountering the gray skeletons of trees killed by the snake vine. Even the sun did little to brighten the dense woods. Chase's demeanor became distant, harder, as he observed everything carefully. Several times he dismounted, walking his horse as he studied the ground, reading tracks. They crossed a stream that flowed out of the mountains, the water churning sluggish, cold, and muddy. Chase stopped and sat, watching off into the shadows. The rest of them waited, looking at one another and toward the boundary. Richard recognized the dead smell of the vine drifting in the air. The boundary warden led them a little farther, then got off his horse and squatted, studying the ground. When he rose, he handed the reins of his horse to Zed. He turned to them and said simply, Wait. They watched him disappear into the trees as they sat quietly. Kalin's big horse shivered flies off its hide as it nibbled grass. Chase returned, pulling his black gauntlets on, and took the reins from Zed. I want you three to keep going. Don't wait for me and don't stop. Keep to the road. What is it? What did you find? Richard asked. Chase turned back and gave him a dark look. The wolves have been feeding. I'm going to bury what's left, and then I'm going cross-country between the boundary and you three. I need to check into something. Remember what I said. Don't stop. Don't run your horses, but keep up a good pace, and keep your eyes sharp. If you think I'm gone too long, don't you dare to think to come back looking for me. I know what I'm doing, and you would never find me. I'll be back with you when I can. Keep going until then and stay on the road. He mounted, turned his horse, and urged it into a run, its hooves kicking up clumps of sod. Get moving! Chase yelled back over his shoulder. As he disappeared through the trees, Richard saw him reach up to a short sword strapped over his shoulder and pull it free. He knew Chase was lying. He wasn't going to bury anything. Richard didn't like to let his friend go off alone like this, but Chase spent most of his life alone out here by the boundary and knew what he was doing what was necessary to protect them. Richard had to trust his judgment. You heard the man, the seeker said. Let's go. As the three rode on through the boundary woods, rock outcroppings grew in size and twisted their route one way and then the other. The trees became so thick that the sunlight was all but banished from the still forest, the road a tunnel through the thicket. Richard didn't like how close everything felt, and as they moved quickly along, they all kept watching the deep shadows to their left. Branches hung across the road, forcing them to duck under as they passed. He couldn't imagine how Chase could travel through a wood this thick. When the way was wide enough, Richard rode up to Kalin's left, wanting to keep himself between her and the boundary. He kept the reins in his left hand to leave his sword hand free. Her cloak was wrapped close around her, but he saw she kept a hand near her knife. Off to their left, in the distance, came howling, something like a wolf pack, only it wasn't wolves. It was something from the boundary. The three jerked their heads toward the sound. The horses were terrified and wanted to run. They had to keep reining in, but at the same time let them have enough freedom to trot. Richard understood the way the horses felt. He felt the urge to let them go, but Chase had said explicitly not to let them run. He must have had a reason, so they held back. When the howling was punctuated with blood-curdling shrieks that made the hair on his neck stand on end, it became more difficult to force himself to prevent the horses from running. The shrieks were wild cries, cries of the need to kill, demanding, desperate. The three rode at a trot for almost an hour, but the sound seemed to follow them. There was nothing they could do but continue, listening as they went to the beasts from the boundary. Unable to stand it any longer, Richard pulled his horse to a halt and faced the woods. Chase was out there alone with the beasts. He couldn't bear any longer to let his friend face it alone. He had to help. Zed turned. We have to keep moving, Richard. He may be in trouble. We can't let him do this alone. It's his job. Let him do it. Right now, his job isn't to be a boundary warden. It's to get us to the pass. The wizard rode back and spoke softly. That's the job he's doing, Richard. He's sworn to protect you with his life. That is what he is doing. Seeing to it, you get to the pass. You have to get it through your head. What you are doing is more important than one man's life. Chase knows that. 
That's why he said not to come back for him. Richard was incredulous. You expect me to let a friend get himself killed if I can help prevent it? The sounds of howling were getting closer. I expect you not to let him die for nothing. Richard stared at his old friend. But maybe we can make the difference. And maybe not. The horses stamped about skittishly. Zed is right, Kalin said. Going after Chase is not the brave thing to do. Going on when you want to help is. Richard knew they were right, but loathed admitting it. He looked angrily toward Kalin. You may be in his position one day. Then, what would you have me do? She looked at him evenly. I would have you go on. He glared at her, not knowing what to say. The shrieks from the woods were closer. Her face showed no emotion. Richard, Chase does this all the time. He will be all right, Zed offered reassuringly. I wouldn't be surprised if he was having a good time. Later on, he will have a good tale to tell. You know Chase. Some of the tale might even be true. Richard was angry at the two of them at himself. He kicked his horse out ahead, taking the lead, not wanting to talk anymore. They left him to his thoughts, let his horse trot ahead. It made him angry that Kalin would think he could leave her like this. She was no boundary warden. He didn't like it that saving them might mean letting them get killed. It didn't make any sense. At least he didn't want it to make any sense. He tried to ignore the shrieks and howls off in the woods. After a time, the cries fell farther behind. The woods seemed devoid of life, no birds or rabbits or even mice, only the twisted trees and bramble and shadows. He listened carefully to make sure he heard the other two following. He didn't want to turn and look, didn't want to face them. After a while, he realized the howls had stopped. He wondered if that was a good sign or not. He wanted to tell them he was sorry, that he was just afraid for his friend, but he couldn't. He felt helpless. Chase would be all right, he told himself. He was the head of the boundary wardens, not a fool, and he wouldn't go into anything he couldn't handle. He wondered if there was anything Chase couldn't handle. He wondered if he would be able to tell Emma if something happened to her husband. He was letting his imagination run away with him. Chase was fine. Not only was he fine, but he would be furious with Richard for thinking these thoughts, for doubting him. He wondered if Chase would return before nightfall. Should they stop for the night if he didn't? No, Chase had said not to stop. They would have to keep going all night if necessary until he rejoined them. He felt as if the mountains were looming over them, ready to pounce. He didn't think he had ever been this close to the boundary. As concerned as he was about Chase, his anger faded. Richard turned and looked back at Kalin. She gave him a warm smile, and he returned it, feeling better. He tried to imagine what the woods here had looked like before so many trees died. It might have been a beautiful place, green, snug, safe. Maybe his father had come this way when he had crossed the boundary, traveled this very road with the book. He wondered if all the trees near the boundary died before it fell. Maybe they could just wait until this one fell too and then go across. Maybe they didn't need to go so far out of their way to the south, to King's Port. But why should he think going south was out of the way? He didn't know where to go in the Midlands, so why was one place better than another? The box they sought could just as easily be in the south as farther north. The woods were getting gloomier. Richard hadn't been able to see the sun for the last couple of hours, but there was no doubt it was setting. He didn't like the idea of traveling these woods at night, but the idea of sleeping in them seemed worse. He checked to make sure the other two were staying close. The sound of running water came faintly through the evening stillness, swelling as they rode, and in a short distance they came to a small river with a wooden bridge over it. Just before they crossed, Richard stopped. He didn't like the look of it. Inexplicably, something felt wrong. Being careful couldn't hurt. He led his horse down the bank and peered underneath. The support beams were anchored to iron rings and granite blocks. The pins were missing. Someone tampered with the bridge. It will support the weight of a man, but not a horse. Looks like we're going to have to get wet. Zed scowled. I don't want to get wet. Well, do you have a better idea? Richard asked. Zed drew his finger and thumb down opposite sides of his smooth chin. Yes, he announced. You two go across. I will hold up the bridge. Richard looked at him, 
as if the wizard had lost his senses. Go on, it will be all right. Zed sat up tall on his horse, held his arms out straight to his sides, palms up, tilted his head back, breathed deeply, and closed his eyes. Reluctantly, cautiously, the other two crossed the bridge. On the other side, they turned their horses and looked back. The wizard's horse began walking across unprompted, while Zed continued to hold his arms out, his head tilted back and his eyes closed. When he reached their side, he brought his arms down and looked at the other two. Richard and Kalen stared at him. Maybe I was wrong, Richard said. Maybe the bridge would hold the weight, Zed smiled. Maybe you were. Without looking back, he snapped his fingers. The bridge collapsed into the water with a crash. The beams groaned as they were torn apart from one another in the current and swept downstream. Then again, maybe you weren't. I couldn't leave it like that. Someone might come across and be hurt. Richard shook his head. Someday, my friend, we are going to sit down and have a long talk. He turned his horse and started off again. Zed looked at Kalen and shrugged. She smiled and gave him a wink, then turned and followed after Richard. They continued down the dismal trail, watching the woods as they went. Richard wondered what else Zed could do. He let his horse pick its own way in the gathering darkness, wondering how much longer this dead world went on, or if the road would ever take them away from it. The night was bringing life to the place, strange calls and scraping noises. His horse whinnied at things unseen. He patted its neck reassuringly and checked the sky for Gars. It was hopeless. He couldn't see any sky. But if Gars came, they would have a hard time surprising the three of them as the canopy of twisted dead limbs and branches would prevent a silent approach. Maybe the things in the trees were more of a threat than Gars. He didn't know anything about them, and he wasn't sure he wanted to. He realized his heart was pounding. After about an hour, he caught the sound of something coming through the brush in the distance to their left. It was breaking branches as it came. He urged his horse into a canter and checked to be sure Kalen and Zed were keeping up. Whatever it was, it was staying with them. They weren't going to be able to get ahead of it. They were going to be cut off. Maybe it was Chase, he thought. Then again, maybe it wasn't. Richard pulled the sword of truth free as he leaned forward and pressed his legs around the horse, spurring it into a gallop. His muscles tensed as his horse raced down the road. He didn't know if Zed and Kalen were keeping up with him, and in fact he never gave it a thought. His mind focused on trying to see ahead in the darkness, trying to see anything that might come at him. Anger was slipping its bounds, heat and need coming forth. Jaw set tight, he charged ahead with lethal intent. The sound of his horse's hooves on the road prevented him from hearing the thing in the woods, but he knew it was there, knew it was coming. Then he saw the black form moving against the barely discernible shapes of the trees. It broke from the woods into the trail a dozen yards in front of him. He raised the sword and went for it, picturing in his mind what he would do. It waited, motionless. At the last instant, he realized it was Chase, holding up an arm to halt him, the silhouette of a flanged mace in his fist. Glad to see you're keeping alert, the Boundary Warden said. Chase! You scared the wits out of me. You gave me a moment of concern, too. Kalen and Zed caught up with him. Follow me. Stay close. Richard, take the rear. Keep your sword out. Chase turned his horse and took off at a gallop, the rest following. Richard didn't know if something was after them or not. Chase didn't act as if there was about to be a fight, but he did tell him to keep his sword out. Richard kept a wary eye over his shoulder. They all hunched their heads down in case there were any low branches. It was dangerous to run the horses in the dark like this, but Chase knew that. They came to a fork in the road, the first one all day, and without hesitation, the boundary warden cut to the right, away from the boundary. Before long, they were clear of the woods, moonlight showing an open country of rolling hills and few trees. Chase slowed after a time, letting the horses walk. Richard sheathed his sword and pulled up close to the others. What was that all about? Chase hooked the mace back onto his belt. Things in the boundary are following us. When they came out of the boundary for you, I was there to spoil their appetite. Some went back in. The ones left continue to follow from within the boundary, where I can't pursue them. 
That's why I didn't want you to go too fast. I wouldn't have been able to keep up through the woods. They would have gotten ahead of me, and then they would have had you. I took us away from the boundary now because I wanted to get our scent away from them for the night. It's too dangerous to travel that close to the boundary at night. We'll camp on one of those hills up there. He looked over his shoulder at Richard. By the way, why did you stop back there? I told you not to. I was worried about you. I heard the howling. I was going to come and help. Zed and Kalen talked me out of it. Richard thought Chase would be angry, but he wasn't. Thanks, but don't do that again. While you were standing there thinking about it, they almost had you. Zed and Kalen were right. Don't argue with them the next time. Richard felt his ears burning. He knew they were right, but it didn't make him feel any better about not helping a friend. Chase, Kalen asked. You said they had gotten someone. Was that true? His face was cold stone in the moonlight. Yes, one of my men. I don't know which one. He turned back to the trail and rode on in silence. They set up camp on a high hill to give a clear view of anything that approached. Chase and Zed tended to the horses while Richard and Kalen started the fire, unpacked bread, cheese, and dried fruit, and began cooking a simple stew. She went with him and scouted for firewood among the sparse trees, helping carry it back. He told her the two of them made a good team. She smiled a little smile and turned away. He took her arm and turned her back. Kalen, if it had been you, I would have come after you, he said, meaning more than the words he spoke. She studied his eyes. Please, Richard, don't even say that. She gently pulled her arm away and went back to camp. When the other two, back from tending the horses, came into the firelight, Richard could see that the scabbard strapped over Chase's shoulder was empty, the short sword missing. One of his battle axes and several long knives were gone, too. Not that this left him defenseless, far from it. The mace hanging from his belt was covered in blood from one end to the other. His gauntlets were soaked with it, and it was splattered everywhere on him. Without comment, he pulled a knife pried a three-inch yellowish tooth from the mace where it was wedged between two of the blades and threw the tooth over his shoulder into the darkness. After wiping the blood off his hands and face, he sat down in front of the fire with the others. Richard tossed a stick in the fire. Chase, what were those creatures that were after us? And how could anything go in and out of the boundary? Chase picked up a loaf of bread and tore off about a third. He met Richard's eyes. They're called... Heart hounds. They're about twice the size of a wolf. Big barrel chests. Heads are kind of flat, big snout, full of teeth. Fierce. I'm not sure what color they are. They only prowl at night. Until today, that is. But it was too dark in those woods to tell, and anyway, I was kind of busy. There were more than I've ever seen together before. Why are they called heart hounds? Chase chewed a piece of bread as he stared back with intense eyes. That's a matter of some debate. Heart hounds have big rounded ears, good hearing. Some say they can find a man by hearing the beating of his heart. Richard's eyes whitened. Chase took another bite of bread, chewing for a minute. Others say they're called heart hounds because that's how they kill. They come at your chest. Most predators go for the throat, but not heart hounds. They go straight for your heart, and they have big enough teeth to get the job done. It's the first thing they eat, too. If there's more than one hound, they'll fight over the heart. Zed dished himself a bowl of stew and handed the ladle to Kalim. Richard was losing his appetite, but he had to ask. And what do you think? Chase shrugged. Well, I've never sat real quiet in the dark next to the boundary just to find out if they could hear my heart beating. He took another bite of bread, looking down at his chest as he chewed. He pulled the heavy mail away from himself. There were two long, ragged rips in the chain. Broken pieces of yellow teeth were jammed into mangled links. The leather tunic behind it was soaked with hound's blood. The one that did this had the blade of my short sword broken off in his chest, and I was still on my horse at the time. He looked back to Richard and raised an eyebrow. That answer your question. Bumps ran up Richard's arms. What about the way they can go in and out of the boundary? Chase took the bowl of stew from Kalen as she handed it to him. They have something to do with the magic of the boundary. They were created with it. They are the boundary's watchdogs, so to speak. They can go in and out without being claimed by it. 
but they're tied to it, too, and can't go far from it. With the boundary weakening, they've been straying farther and farther all the time. That makes traveling Hawker's Trail dangerous, but to go another way would add a good week to the journey to King's Port. The cutoff we took is the only one that veers away from the boundary until we get to South Haven. I knew I had to reach you before you passed it, or we would have had to spend the night back there with them. Tomorrow, in the daylight, when it's safer, I'll show you the boundary, how it's weakening. Richard nodded as they all went back to their own thoughts. They are tan, Kaylin said softly. They all turned to her. She sat staring into the fire. The heart hounds are tan with short fur, like that on the back of a deer. They are seen everywhere now in the Midlands, having been released from their bonds when the other boundary failed. Crazed with lack of purpose, now they even come out in the daytime. The three men sat motionless, considering her words. Even Zed stopped eating. Great, Richard said under his breath. And what else does the Midlands have that is even worse? He didn't mean it as a question, more as a curse or frustration. The fire crackled, warm on their faces. Kaylin's eyes were in a faraway place. Dark and raw, she whispered. Chapter 13 Richard sat away from the camp, leaning against a cold rock, his cloak wrapped tightly around himself as he looked out toward the boundary. What little wind there was bore a breath of ice. Chase had given him the first watch. Zed was to have the second, and the warden the third. Kaylin had protested when she wasn't given a watch, but in the end went along with Chase's wishes. Moonlight illuminated the open land between where he sat and the boundary. It was an expanse of gentle hills, a few trees and small streams, a pleasant-looking place considering how near it was to the grim boundary woods. Of course, the woods had probably been pleasant at one time, too, before Dark and Rawl had put the boxes in play and started the destruction of the boundary. Chase had said he didn't think the heart hounds could stray this far, but if he was wrong, Richard intended to see them coming. He ran his hand over the hilt of his sword for reassurance, fingering the word truth on it, tracing its raised letters absently while he scanned the night sky, vowing not to let the gars take him by surprise again. He was glad he was given the first watch, since he wasn't sleepy. He was fatigued, but not sleepy. Still, he yawned. The mountains that were part of the boundary lay off at the edge of darkness, beyond the tangled mat of woods rising up like the spine of a dark beast too big to hide itself. Richard wondered what manner of things were looking back at him from that black maw. Chase had said the boundary mountains diminished as they went south and would be all but gone where they were going. Unexpectedly, Kaylin, her cloak also wrapped snug about, slipped up silently in the darkness and wedged herself tight against him for warmth. She didn't talk, simply sat close. Stray wisps of her silky hair touched the side of his face. The handle of her knife jabbed into his side, but he didn't say anything for fear that if he did, she would move away. He didn't want her to move. The other's asleep, he asked quietly, glancing over his shoulder. She nodded. How can you tell? he asked with a smile. Zed sleeps with his eyes open. She smiled back. All wizards do. Really? I thought it was just Zed. As he scanned the valley for any movement, he could feel her eyes on him. He looked back at her. Aren't you sleepy? She was so close he didn't have to speak in much more than a whisper. She shrugged. The light breeze pulled some of her long hair across her face. She reached up and pulled it back. Her eyes found his. I wanted to tell you I was sorry. He wished she would lay her head on his shoulder, but she didn't. About what? About what I said to you before, that I wouldn't want you to come after me. I did not want you to think I don't appreciate your friendship. I do. It's just that what we are doing is more important than any one person. He knew she had meant much more than she said, just as he had. He looked into her eyes, felt her breath on his face. Kalen, do you have someone? He feared the arrow to his heart, but had to ask. Someone at home who waits for you, I mean? A love? He held the gaze of her green eyes for a long time. She didn't look away, but her eyes filled with tears. More than anything, he wanted to put his arms around her and kiss her. She reached up, letting the backs of her fingers brush his face gently. She cleared her throat. 
It is not that simple, Richard. Yes, it is. Either you do or you don't. I have obligations. For a time, it seemed she was going to tell him something, tell him her secret. She looked so beautiful in the moonlight. But it wasn't only the way she looked. It was what was inside her, everything from her intelligence and courage to her wit and the special smile she gave only to him. He would slay a dragon if there were such a thing just to see that smile. He knew he would never want anyone else for as long as he lived. He would rather spend the rest of his life alone than with someone else. There could be no one else. He desperately wanted to hug her close. He ached to taste her soft lips, but he was inexplicably getting the same feeling he had had before he crossed the bridge. It was a strong feeling of warning, stronger than his desire to kiss her. Something told him that if he did, it would be crossing one bridge too many. He remembered how the magic flared when she had touched his hand as he held the sword. He had been right about the bridge, so he didn't put his arms around her. She broke the gaze with a glance to the ground. Chase said the next two days are going to be rough. I guess I had better get some sleep. He knew that whatever was going on in her head, he had no say in it. He couldn't force her. It was something she had to handle herself. You have an obligation to me, too, he said. She looked back to him with a questioning frown, and he smiled. You have promised to be my guide. I intend to hold you to that promise. She smiled and could only nod, too close to tears to speak. She kissed the end of her finger and pressed it against his cheek, then slipped back into the night. Richard sat in the dark trying to swallow past the lump in his throat. Long after she was gone, he could still feel the place on his cheek where she had put her finger, her kiss. The night was so still that Richard felt as if he were the only one awake in the whole world. Stars flickered, looking like Zed's magic dust frozen in place as the moon stared silently down at him. Not even the wolves sang tonight. Loneliness threatened to crush him. He found himself wishing something would attack just so he would have something else to think about. He pulled out his sword and, for something to do, polished its already gleaming blade with the corner of his cloak. It was his sword to use as he saw fit. That's what Zed had told him. Whether Kaelin liked it or not, he was going to use it to protect her. She was hunted. Anything that tried to touch her was going to have to come through his sword first. The thought of her hunters, the quads, and Dark and Rahl made his anger heat. He wanted them to come now so he could put an end to the threat. He hungered for them. His heart pounded, his jaws clenched. He realized suddenly that it was the sword's anger awakening his. The sword was free from its scabbard, and the mere thought of something threatening Kalin was making its anger and his anger come forth. He was startled at how it had seeped into him, so quiet, so unseen, so seductive. Simply perception, the wizard had said. What was the sword's magic perceiving in him? Richard slid the sword back into its scabbard, put back the anger, feeling the gloom seep through him once again as he resumed his scan of the countryside and sky. He stood and walked around to relieve the cramps in his legs, then sat once more against the rock, inconsolable. An hour before his watch was due to end, he heard quiet footsteps he recognized. It was Zed, a piece of cheese in each hand with no cloak, wearing only his simple robes. What are you doing up? It's not time for your watch yet. I thought you might like the company of a friend. Here, I brought you a piece of cheese. No, thanks. About the cheese, I mean. I could use the friend part, though. Zed sat down next to him, folding his bony knees up to his chest, pulling the robes down over them, making himself the center of a little tent. What's the problem? Richard shrugged. Kalen, I guess. Zed didn't say anything. Richard looked over. She's the first thing in my mind when I wake and the last thing in my mind before I sleep. I've never felt like this before, Zed. Never felt this alone before. I see. Zed laid the cheese on a rock. I know she likes me, but I get the feeling she's keeping me at arm's length. When we were setting up camp tonight, I told her that if it had been her like Chase today, I would have come after her. A while ago, she came out here to see me. She said she didn't want me coming after her, but she meant more than that. She meant she didn't want me coming after her, period. Good girl, said, said under his breath. What? 
I said she's a good girl. We all like her. But, Richard, she is other things, too. She has responsibilities. Richard frowned at the old man. And what are those other things? Zed leaned back a little. It's not for me to say. She is the one to answer that. I would have thought she would have done so by now. The old man put his arm around Richard's big shoulders. If it makes you feel any better, the only reason she hasn't is because she cares for you more than she should. She is afraid of losing your friendship. You know about her secrets, and Chase knows. I can see it in his eyes. Everyone knows but me. She tried to tell me tonight, but she couldn't. She shouldn't worry about losing my friendship. That won't happen. Richard, she is a wonderful person, but she is not the one for you. She can't be that. Why? Zed plucked something off his sleeve as he spoke, avoiding Richard's eyes. I gave my word I would allow her to be the one to tell you. You will just have to trust me. She cannot be what you want. Find another girl. The land is awash with them. Why, half of all the people are girls. There are plenty to pick from. Pick another. Richard drew his knees up, folded his arms across them, looking away. All right. Zed looked up in surprise, then smiled and patted his young friend's back. All right, on one condition, Richard added, as he scanned the boundary woods. You answer one question honestly, toasted toads honest. If you can answer yes, then I will do as you ask. One? Only one question? Zed asked cautiously, putting a bony finger to his thin bottom lip. One question. Zed thought about it a minute. Very well, one question. Richard turned his fierce eyes to the old man. Before you married your wife, if someone... Tell you what, let's make it even easier for you to say yes. If someone you trusted, a friend, someone you loved like a father, if that person had come to you and said, pick another, would you have done so? Zed looked away from Richard's eyes and took a deep breath. Bags. You would think by now I would have learned not to let a seeker ask me a question. He picked up the cheese and took a bite. I thought as much. Zed threw the cheese away into the darkness. That doesn't change the facts, Richard. It will not work between you two. I'm not saying this to hurt you. I love you like a son. If I could change the way the world works, I would. I wish it were not so for your sake, but there is no way for it to work. Kaelin knows it, and if you try, you will only hurt her. I know you don't want that. Richard's voice was calm, quiet. You said it yourself. I am the seeker. There is a way, and I will find it. Zed shook his head sadly. I wish it were so, my boy, but it is not. Then what am I to do? Richard asked in a broken whisper. His old friend put his skinny arms around him and hugged him close in the darkness. Richard felt numb. Just be her friend, Richard. That's what she needs. But you can be nothing more. Richard nodded in Zed's arms. After a few minutes, the seeker, a suspicious look in his eye, pushed away, holding the wizard at arm's length. What is it you came out here for? To sit with a friend. Richard shook his head. You came out here as wizard, away from the others, to counsel the seeker. Now, tell me why you're here. Very well. I came here in my capacity as wizard to tell the seeker he almost made a serious mistake today. Richard took his hands from Zed's shoulders, but continued to hold his gaze. I know that. A seeker cannot put himself at risk when by doing so he puts everyone else at risk. But you were going to do it anyway, Zed pressed. When you named me Seeker, you took the bad with the good. I'm new at the responsibilities of the position. It's hard for me to see a friend in trouble and not help. I know I can't afford that luxury anymore. Consider me reprimanded. Zed smiled. Well, that part went well. He sat a minute, his smile faded. But Richard, the issue is bigger than just what happened today. You must understand that, as Seeker, you may cause the death of innocent people. In order to succeed in stopping Rahl, you may have to turn away from those who might be saved with your help. A soldier knows that on the battlefield, if he bends to help a downed comrade, he might take a sword in the back. And so, 
If he is to win, he must fight on despite the cries for help from his fellows. You must be able to do this to win. It may be the only way. You must steel yourself to it. This is a struggle for survival. And in this battle, the ones crying for help probably won't be soldiers, but innocents. Dark and Raal will kill anyone to win. Those who fight on his side will do the same. You may have to do the same, like it or not. The aggressor makes the rules. You must play by them, or you will surely die by them. How could anyone fight on his side? Dark and Raal wants to dominate everyone, to be the master of all. How could they fight for him? The wizard leaned back against the rock and looked out over the hills, as if seeing more than was there. His tone was sorrowful. Because, Richard, many people must be ruled to thrive. In their selfishness and greed, they see free people as their oppressors. They wish to have a leader who will cut the taller plants so the sun will reach them. They think no plant should be allowed to grow taller than the shortest, and in that way give light to all. They would rather be provided a guiding light, regardless of the fuel, than light a candle themselves. Some of them think that when Raal wins, he will smile on them and they will be rewarded. And so they are as ruthless as he to gain his favor. Some are simply blind to the truth and fight for the lies they hear. And some find, once that guiding light is lit, that they are wearing chains, and then it is too late. Zed smoothed his sleeves down his arm as he sighed. There have always been wars, Richard. Every war is a murderous struggle between foes, and yet no army has ever marched into battle thinking that the Creator had sided with their enemy. Richard shook his head. It doesn't make sense. I am quite sure that Rawls' followers think that we are bloodthirsty monsters capable of anything. They will have been told endless tales of their enemy's ruthless brutality. I'm sure none of them know much about Dark and Rahl, except what they have been told by Dark and Rahl. The wizard frowned, his intelligent eyes sharp. It may be a perversion of logic, but that makes it no less threatening or deadly. Rahl's followers need only to crush us. They don't have to understand anything else. But for you to win against a stronger foe, you must use your head. Richard ran his fingers through his hair. That leaves me stuck in an awfully tight crack. I may have to let innocent people die, yet I can't kill Dark and Rawl. Zed gave him a meaningful look. No. I never said you couldn't kill Dark and Rawl. I said you couldn't use the sword to kill him. Richard looked intently over at his old friend, the moonlight dim on the other's angular face. Sparks of thought lit in the darkness of his mood. Zed he asked quietly. Have you had to do that? Have you had to let innocent people die? Zed's face turned hard and pensive. In the last war, and again now as we speak, Kalen told me Raal kills people to get my name. No one can give it. But he continues to kill in the hope someone will finally offer it. I could turn myself over to him to stop the killing, but then I wouldn't be able to help defeat him, and many more would die. It's a painful choice. Let a few die horribly, or let even more die horribly. I'm sorry, my friend. Richard wrapped his cloak tighter about himself, chilled from without and from within. He looked back out over the still landscape, then back at Zed. I met the night wisp, Shar, before she died. She gave her life to get Kalin here, so others might live. Kalin also bears the burden of letting others die. She does, Zed said softly. It makes my heart ache to know the things that girl's eyes have seen, and the things your eyes may have to see. Makes my problem about the two of us seem pretty small. Zed's expression was gentle with compassion. But not hurt any less. Richard made another scan of the countryside. Zed, one more thing. Before we reached your house, I offered Kalen an apple. Zed gave a surprised laugh. You offered a red fruit to someone from the Midlands? That's tantamount to a death threat, my boy. 
In the Midlands, red fruit of any kind is deadly poison. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't at the time. Zed leaned over, lifting an eyebrow. What did she say? Richard looked at him sideways. It isn't what she said, it's what she did. She grabbed me by the throat. For a moment, I could see in her eyes that she was going to kill me. I don't know how she was going to kill me, but I'm sure she was going to do it. She hesitated long enough for me to explain. The point is, she was my friend, and she had saved my life several times, but in that instant, she was going to kill me. Richard paused. That's part of what you were saying, isn't it? Zed let out a long breath and nodded. It is. Richard, if you suspected I was a traitor, weren't sure, just suspected, and you knew that if it were true, our cause would be lost, would you be able to kill me? If you had no time or way to find the truth, only the strong belief I was a traitor, and only you knew, could you kill me on the spot? Could you come at me, your old friend with lethal intent, with enough violence to see the job done? Zed's stare burned into him. Richard was stunned. I... I don't know. Well, you had better know that you could, or you have no business going after all. You won't have the resolve to live, to win. You may be called upon to make a life-and-death decision instantly. Kaylin knows this. She knows the consequences if she fails. She has the resolve. She hesitated, though. From what you're saying, she made a mistake. I could have overpowered her. She should have killed me before I had a chance to, Richard frowned. And she would have been wrong. Zed shook his head slowly. Don't flatter yourself, Richard. She had her hand on you. Anything you would have done wouldn't have been quick enough. All it would have taken is a thought on her part. She was in control and could afford to give you the chance to explain. She made no mistake. A little shaken, Richard still wasn't ready to concede the issue. But you wouldn't. You couldn't be a traitor to us, just as I would never hurt her. I don't see the point. The point is, even though I wouldn't, if I did, you have to be prepared to act. You have to have the strength to do even that, if necessary. The point is that even though Kayla knew you were her friend and wouldn't hurt her, when she thought you were trying to, she was prepared to act. If you hadn't quickly made her believe you, she would have. Richard sat in silence for a moment, watching his friend. Zed. If it were the other way around, if you thought I was a danger to our cause, well, you know, could you... The wizard leaned back, frowning, and without a hint of emotion in his voice, said... In a twinkling. The answer appalled Richard, but he understood what his friend was telling him, even if the scenario seemed far-fetched. Anything less than total commitment could spell their failure. If they faltered, Rawl would not be merciful. They would die. It was that simple. Still want to be seeker? Zed asked. Richard stared out at nothing. Yes. Scared? To the bone. Zed patted his knee. Good, me too. I would worry only if you were not. The seeker gave the wizard an icy glare. I intend to make Dark and Rawl afraid too. Zed smiled and nodded. You are going to make a good seeker, my boy. Have faith. Richard gave a mental shudder at the thought of Kaylin killing him just for offering her an apple. He frowned. Zed, why are all red fruits in the Midlands deadly poison? It isn't natural. The wizard gave a sorrowful shake of his head. Because, Richard, children like red fruit. Richard's frown deepened. That doesn't make any sense. Zed looked down, pushing a bony finger at the dirt for a moment. It was about this time of year in the last war the harvests were in. I had found a constructed magic. That's a magic made by wizards of long ago, something like the boxes of Orden. It was a poison magic, specific to color, and only able to cast one spell one time. I wasn't sure how it was used, but I knew it was dangerous. Zed took a deep breath and put his hands in his lap. Anyway, Panis Rahl got his hands on it and figured out how to make it work. He knew children loved fruit and wanted to strike a blow at our hearts. He used the magic to poison all red fruit. It's a little like the poison of the snake vine, slow at first. It took time for us to realize what caused the fever and death. 
Panis Ral deliberately chose something he could be sure children, not just the adults, would eat. His voice was barely audible as he looked out into the darkness. A lot of people died. A lot of children. Richard's eyes were wide. If you found it, how did he get hold of it? Zed looked into Richard's eyes with an expression that could have frozen a summer day. I had a student, a young man I was training. One day I chanced upon him tinkering with something he shouldn't have been. I had an odd doubt about him. I knew something was wrong, but I was very fond of him, and so I didn't act upon my suspicion. Instead, I decided to think on it for the night. The next morning he was gone, and so was the constructed magic I had found. He had been a spy for Panis Ral. If I had acted when I should have and killed him, all those people, all those children, wouldn't have died. Richard swallowed. Zed, you couldn't have known. He thought that maybe the old man was going to yell or cry or storm off, but instead he only shrugged. Learn from my mistake, Richard. If you do, then all those lives won't have been lost for nothing. Maybe their story can be a lesson that will help save everyone from what Dark and Rahl will do if he wins. Richard rubbed his arms, trying to work a bit of warmth back into them. Why isn't the red fruit in Westland poison? All magic has limits. This had a limit of distance from where it was used. It stretched as far as where the boundary between Westland and the Midlands went up. The boundary couldn't be put up where any of the poison spell was, or Westland would have had magic in it. Richard sat in the dark, cold silence and thought for a time. At last he asked, Is there any way to get rid of it? To make the red fruit no longer poison? Zed smiled. Richard thought it was an odd thing to do, but he was glad to see it. Thinking like a wizard, my boy. Thinking how to undo magic. He frowned in thought as he looked out into the night again. There might be a way to remove the spell. I would have to study it and see what I could do. If we can defeat Dark and Rahl, I intend to put my mind to the task. Good. Richard tugged his cloak tighter. Everyone should be able to eat an apple when they want, especially children. He looked over at the old man. Zed, I promise I will remember your lesson. I won't let you down. I won't let all those people who died be forgotten. Zed smiled and gave Richard's back an affectionate rub. The two friends sat in silence, sharing the stillness of the night and the quiet of each other's understanding, thinking about what they could not know, what was to come. Richard thought about what was needed to be done, about Panis Rahl, and about Dark and Rahl. He thought about how hopeless everything seemed. Think about the solution, he told himself, not the problem. You are the seeker. I need you to do something, wizard. I think it is time for us to disappear. Rahl has followed us long enough. What can you do about that cloud? You know, I think you're right. I only wish I knew how it was hooked to you so I could unhook it. But I can't figure it out, so I will have to do something else. He contemplatively drew his finger and thumb down the sharp sides of his jaw. Has it rained or been overcast since it first started following you? Richard thought back, trying to remember every day. Most of the time he had been in a fog over his father's murder. It seemed so long ago. The night before I found the snake vine, it rained in the ven. By the time I got there, it had cleared off. No, no rain. I don't remember it being cloudy since my father's murder. At least nothing more than a few high, thin clouds. What does that mean? Well, it means I think there is a way to fool the cloud, even if I can't unhook it. Since the sky has been clear all that time, that means Raoul probably has been responsible. He has moved the other clouds away so he could easily find this one. Simple, but effective. How could he move the clouds away? He put a spell on this one to repel other clouds and somehow hooked this one to you. Then why don't you put a stronger spell on it to attract other clouds? Before he realizes it, it will be lost and he won't be able to find it to try to outdo your magic. If he does use stronger magic to move the clouds away to find this one, he won't know what you have done and the stronger spell that pushes the clouds away will break the hook. 
Zed gave him an incredulous look. His eyes blinked. Bags, Richard. You have gotten it exactly right. My boy, I think you would have made an excellent wizard. No, thanks. I already have one impossible job. Zed drew back a little and frowned, but didn't say anything. His thin hand reached into his robes and pulled out a rock, tossing it on the ground in front of them. He stood and his fingers spun around in a circle over the little rock until suddenly it popped into a large rock. Zed, that's your cloud rock. Actually, my boy, it's a wizard's rock. My father gave it to me long ago. The wizard's finger stirred faster and faster until light came forth, sparkles and colors swirling around. He continued to stir, mixing and blending the light. There was no sound, only the pleasant smell of a spring rain. At last, the wizard seemed satisfied. Step up on the rock, my boy. Unsure at first, Richard stepped into the light. It tingled and felt warm against his skin, as if he were lying in the hot summer sun without clothes after a swim. He let himself bask in the warm, safe feeling, gave himself over to it. His hands floated outward from his sides until they were horizontal. He tilted his head back, took deep breaths, and closed his eyes. He felt wondrous, like floating in water, only he was floating in light. Exhilaration soaked through him. His mind felt a buoyant, timeless connection to everything around him. He was one with the trees, the grass, the bugs, the birds, the animals all around, the water, the very air itself. Not a separate being, but part of a whole. He understood the interconnection of everything in a new way, saw himself as inconsequential and empowered at the same time. He saw the world through the eyes of all the creatures around him. It was a shocking, marvelous insight. He let himself soar into a bird that flew overhead, saw the world through its eyes, hunted with it, hungry and needful for mice, watched the campfire below, the people sleeping. Richard let his identity scatter to the winds. He became no one and everyone, felt the heat of their needs, smelled their fear, tasted their joy and understood their desires, and then let it all melt away into nothingness, until there was a void where he stood, alone in the universe, the only living thing, the only thing existing at all. Then he let the light flood through him, light that brought forth the others that had used this very rock. Zed, Zed's father, and the wizards before that, for untold years, thousands of years, one and all. Their essence flowed through him, shared themselves with him as tears streamed down his cheeks at the wonder of it all. Zed's hand sprang forward, loosing his magic dust. It swirled about Richard, glittering fluidly until he was at the center of its vortex. The sparkles tightened their rotation and gathered at his chest. With a tinkling sound like a crystal chandelier in the wind, the dust climbed away into the sky as if climbing a kite string, taking the sound with it as it went higher and higher until it reached the cloud. The cloud took in the magic dust and was lit from within by roiling colors. All across the horizon, lightning flashed, ragged streaks ripping this way and that, called forth, eager, expectant. All at once, the lightning stopped. The illumination in the cloud faded and was gone, and the light from the wizard's rock pulled itself inward until it was extinguished. There was sudden silence. Richard was there again, standing on a simple rock. He looked wide-eyed at Zed's smiling face. Zed, he whispered, now I know why you stand on this rock all the time. I've never felt anything like that in my life. I had no idea. Zed smiled knowingly. You're a natural, my boy. You held your arms just right. Your head had the proper tilt. You even arched your back correctly. You took to it like a duckling to a pond. You have all the makings of a fine wizard. He leaned forward gleefully. Now, just try to imagine doing it naked. It makes a difference? Richard asked in amazement. Of course. The clothes interfere with the experience. Zed put his arm around Richard's shoulder. Someday I will let you try it. Zed, why did you have me do that? It wasn't necessary. You could have done it. How do you feel now? I don't know. Different. Relaxed. More clear-headed. I guess not as overpowered, not as depressed. That's why I let you do it, my friend, because you needed it. You have had a hard night. I can't change the problems, but I could help you feel better. Thank you, Zed. Go get some sleep. It's my watch now. He gave Richard a wink. 
If you ever change your mind about becoming a wizard, I would be proud to welcome you into the Brotherhood. Zed held up his hand. Out of the darkness, the piece of cheese he had thrown away floated back to him. Chapter 14 Chase reined in his horse. Here, this'll be a good place. He led the other three off the trail through an open tract of long dead spruce, the silver-gray skeleton standing bare of all but a few branches and an occasional wisp of dull green moss. The soft ground was littered with the rotting corpses of the former monarchs. Brown bogweed, its broad, flat leaves laid down in haphazard fashion by past storms, looked like a tangled sea of dead snakes underfoot. The horses picked their way carefully among the tangle. Warm air, heavy with humidity, carried the fetid smell of decay. A fog of mosquitoes followed them as they went, the only things alive as far as Richard could tell. As open as this place was, little brightness was offered by the sky, as a thick, uniform overcast of clouds hung oppressively close to the ground. Trailers of mist dragged across the silver spikes of the trees that remained standing, leaving them wet and slick. Chase led the way for Zed and then Kalin, with Richard following behind, watching over them as they twisted their way along. Visibility was limited to less than a few hundred feet, and even though Chase didn't seem to be concerned, Richard kept a sharp lookout. Anything could sneak up close before they would be able to see it. All four swatted at the mosquitoes, and except for Zed, they kept their cloaks tight for protection. Zed, who shunned wearing a cloak, nibbled on the remnants of lunch, looking about as if on a sightseeing excursion. Richard had an excellent sense of direction, but was glad they had Chase to lead them. Everything in the bog looked the same, and he knew from experience how easy it would be to become lost. Since Richard had stood on the wizard's rock the night before, he felt the weight of his responsibilities less of a burden and more of an opportunity to be a part of something right. He didn't feel the danger any less, but felt more strongly his need to be part of stopping Rahl. He saw his part in the scheme of things as a chance to help others who had no chance to fight Dark and Rahl. He knew he couldn't back away. That would be the end of him, and a lot of others. Richard watched Kaylin's body sway as she rode, her shoulders moving to the horse's rhythm. He wished he could take her to places he knew of in the Heartland Woods, secret places of beauty and peace, far back in the mountains, show her the waterfall he had found and the cave behind it, have lunch by a quiet forest pond with her, take her into town, buy her something pretty, take her someplace, any place, where she would be safe. He wanted her to be able to smile without having to worry every minute if her enemies were getting closer. After last night, he felt that the first part, his fantasy of being with her, was just an empty wish. With a hand in the air, Chase brought them to a halt. This is the place. Richard looked around. They were still in the middle of an endless, dead, dried-up bog. He didn't see any boundary. It all looked the same in every direction. They tethered their horses to a fallen log and followed Chase a short distance farther on foot. The boundary, Chase announced, holding his arm out at the introduction. I don't see anything, Richard said. Chase smiled. Watch. He walked on, steadily, slowly. As he went forward, a green glow formed around him, at first hardly perceptible. It grew stronger, brighter, until after another twenty steps it became a sheet of green light pressing against him as he proceeded, stronger close to him and fading away about ten feet to the sides and above, growing larger with every step. It was like green glass, wavy and distorted, but Richard could see through it, see the dead trees beyond, Chase stopped and returned. The green sheet and then the green glow faded and vanished as he came back. Richard had always thought the boundary would be a wall of some sort, something that could be seen. That's it? Richard felt a little let down. What more do you want? Now, watch this. Chase searched the ground, picking up branches, testing each for strength. Most were rotten and broke easily. Finally, he found one about a dozen feet long that was strong enough to suit him. He carried it back into the glowing light until he reached the sheet of green. Holding the branch by the thick end, he passed the rest through the wall. Six feet away, the end of the stick disappeared as he pushed it forward until he was holding what appeared to be a six-foot stick instead of a twelve-foot branch. Richard was perplexed. He could see beyond the wall, but not the other end of the stick. It didn't seem possible. 
As soon as Chase had pushed the stick in as far as he dared, it jumped violently. There was no sound. He hauled it back and returned to the others. He held the splintered end of a now eight-foot stick toward them. The end was covered with slaver. Hard hounds, he said with a grin. Zed seemed bored. Kalin was not amused. Richard was astounded. Since he seemed to have an audience of only one, Chase grabbed a fistful of Richard's shirt and dragged him off. Come on, I'll show you what it's like. Chase locked his right arm together with Richard's left as they proceeded, cautioning Richard. Go slow. I'll let you know when we've gone far enough. Keep hold of my arm. They walked ahead slowly. Green light began. With each step it became more intense, but it was different from when Richard had watched Chase go in by himself. Then the light had been to Chase's sides and above him. Now it was all about. There was a buzzing sound, like a thousand bumblebees. With each step, the sound became deeper, but not louder. The green light became deeper, too, and the surrounding wood darker, as if night were falling. Then the sheet of green was in front of them, materializing out of nothing, with the green glow everywhere else. Richard could hardly see the woods anymore. He looked back and couldn't see Zed or Kalin at all. Easy now, Chase warned. They pushed against the green sheet as they stepped slowly ahead. Richard could feel the pressure of it against his body. Then everything else blacked out as if he were in a cave at night with a green glow around Chase and himself. Richard held Chase's arm tighter. The buzzing felt like it was vibrating his chest. With the next step, the green sheet of the wall changed suddenly. Far enough, Chase said, his voice echoing. The wall had become darkly transparent, as if Richard were looking into a deep pond in the dark woods. Chase stood still, watching him. There were forms on the other side. Inky black shapes wavered in the gloom on the other side of the wall, specters floating in the deep. The dead in their lair. Something closer and faster moved nearer to them. The hounds, Chase said. Richard felt an odd sensation of longing. Longing for the blackness. The humming wasn't a sound, he realized. It was voices. Voices that murmured his name. Thousands of distant voices called out to him. The black shapes were gathering, calling to him, holding their arms out to him. He felt a sudden, unexpected stab of loneliness. Felt the solitude of his life, of all life. Why did he need the pain when they were waiting, waiting to welcome him? Never alone again. The black shapes drifted closer in the gloom, calling to him, and he began to see their faces. It was as if he were looking through murky water. They came closer. He longed to step through, to be there with them. And then he saw his father. Richard's heart pounded. His father called out to him mournfully in a long, sorrowful cry. His arms thrust out, trying desperately to clutch for his son. He was just beyond the wall. Richard's heart felt as if it were going to rip with yearning. It had been so long since he had seen his father. He wailed for him, hungered to touch him. He wouldn't have to be afraid ever again. He had only to reach his father. Then he would be safe. Safe forever. Richard tried to reach out to his father, tried to go to him, tried to step through the wall. Something was holding his arm. Irritated, he pulled harder. Someone held him from his father. He screamed for whoever held him to let go. His voice sounded hollow, empty. Then he was being pulled away from his father. His anger roared to life. Someone was trying to drag him back by his arm. In a rage, he grabbed his sword. A big hand clamped over his with an iron grip. Screaming in unrestrained fury, he struggled mightily to free the sword, but the big hands held tight, dragging him, stumbling from his father. Richard struggled, but was hauled away. The green wall came up suddenly in place of the darkness as he was pulled back. Chase was dragging him away from it through the green light. The world returned with a sickening jolt. The dry, dead bog returned. Suddenly aware, Richard was appalled at what he had almost done. Chase released his sword hand. Shaking, Richard put it on the big man's shoulder for support, struggling to catch his breath as they stepped out of the green light. Relief washed over him. Chase leaned over a little, searching his eyes. All right. Richard nodded, too overwhelmed to speak. 
the sight of his father had brought back the devastating grief. He had to concentrate just to breathe, to stand. His throat hurt. He realized he had been choking but hadn't been aware of it at the time. Terror raced through Richard's mind as he realized how close he had come to stepping through the wall to death. He had been totally unprepared for what had happened. If Chase hadn't been there holding on to him, he would be dead now. He had tried to give in to the underworld. He felt as if he didn't know himself. How could he have wanted to give himself over to it? Was he that weak, that frail? Richard's head swirled with pain. He couldn't clear the vision of his father's face from his mind the way his father longed for him, called to him, so desperate. He ached to be with him. It would have been so easy. The image haunted his mind, refusing to let go. He didn't want to let it go. He wanted to go back. He could feel the pull, even as he resisted. Kaylin was there, waiting for them at the edge of the green light as they emerged. She swept her arm protectively around his waist and tugged him away from Chase. With her other hand, she grabbed hold of his jaw, turning his head, making him look at her. Richard, listen to me. Think of something else. Concentrate. You have to think of something else. I want you to remember every intersection on every trail in the heartland. Can you do that for me, please? Do it now. Remember every one for me. He nodded and started to remember the trails. Kalen turned to Chase in a fury, slapping him across his face as hard as she could. You bastard, she screamed. Why would you do that to him? Throwing all her weight into it, she slapped him again, her hair tossing across her face. Chase didn't try to stop her. You did it on purpose. How could you do that? She swung at him a third time, but this time he grabbed her wrist in mid-swing. Do you want me to tell you, or do you wish to go on hitting me? She jerked her hand away, glaring at him, her chest heaving. Some of her hair was stuck sideways across her face. Going through King's Port is dangerous. It isn't straight through. It twists and turns. Some places it's very narrow, the two walls of the boundary almost touching. One step either way and you're gone. You've been through the boundary, so has Zed. You both understand. You can't see it until you start in. Otherwise, you don't know where it is. I only know because I've spent my life out here. It's even more dangerous now because it's failing. Even easier to walk through it. When you get in the pass, if something started chasing you, Richard could run into the underworld without even knowing what it was. That's no excuse. You could have warned him. I've never had a child yet who had the proper respect for fire until they put their hand in it once. No amount of telling is worth doing it once. If Richard didn't understand what it was like before he went into Kingsport, he wouldn't come out the other side. Yes, I took him in there on purpose. To show him. To keep him alive. You could have told him. Chase shook his head. No. He had to see it. Enough, Richard said, his head clear at last. They all turned to him. A day has yet to go by when one of you three doesn't scare the wits out of me. But I know you all have my best interests at heart. Right now we have more important things to worry about. Chase, how do you know the boundary is failing? What's different? The wall is breaking down. Before, you couldn't see through the green into the darkness. You couldn't see anything on the other side. Chase is right, Zed offered. I could see it from here. How long until it fails, Richard asked the wizard. Zed shrugged. It's hard to tell. Then guess, Richard shot back. Give me some kind of idea, your best guess. It will last at least two weeks, but not more than six or seven. Richard thought a minute. Can you use your magic to strengthen it? I don't have that kind of power. Chase, do you think Rahl knows about King's Port? How should I know? Well, has anyone come through the pass? Chase thought about the question. Not that I know of. I doubt it, Zed added. Raal can travel the underworld. He doesn't need the pass. He's bringing the boundary down. I don't think he cares about a little pass. Caring is different from knowing, Richard said. I don't think we should be standing here, and I'm worried he might know where we're going. Kaylin pulled the hair off her face. What do you mean? Richard gave her a sympathetic look. Do you think it was your mother and sister you saw when you were in there? I thought it was. Do you think otherwise? I don't think that was my father. He looked to the wizard. What do you think? It's impossible to say. No one really knows all that much about the underworld. Dark and Rawl knows about it, Richard said bitterly. 
I don't think my father would want me in that manner. But I know Rahl would. So despite what my eyes tell me, it's more likely that it was Dark and Rahl's disciples trying to take me. You said we couldn't go through the boundary because they were waiting for us to do so, waiting to get us. I think that was what I saw, his followers in the underworld. And they know right where I touched the wall. If I'm right, that means Rahl will soon know where we are. I don't want to be here to find out if I'm right. Richard is right, Chase said. And we have to get to Scowl Swamp before nightfall, before the heart hounds come out. It's the only safe place between here and South Haven. We'll reach South Haven before tomorrow night, and we'll be safe from the hounds there. The next day, we will go see a friend of mine, Addie, the Bone Woman. She lives near the pass. We need her help to get through. But tonight, our only chance is the swamp. Richard was about to ask what a Bone Woman was and why they needed her help to cross the boundary when a dark, shadowy form suddenly whipped out of the air, striking Chase so hard it threw him across several downed trees. With shocking speed, the black form wrapped around Kaylin's legs, whip-like, pulling her feet from under her. She screamed Richard's name as he dove, grabbing for her. They locked their hands around each other's wrists. Both were dragged across the ground toward the boundary. Zed's fingers threw fire over their heads. It shrieked past and vanished. Another black appendage struck out at the wizard with lightning speed, knocking the old man through the air. Richard hooked a foot around a branch on a log. Rotten, it tore from the stump. He twisted his body around, trying to dig his heels into the ground. His boots slid across the wet bog weed. He jammed his heels into the earth, but wasn't strong enough to hold the two of them from being dragged across the ground. He needed his hands free. Put your arms around my waist, he yelled. Kaylin lunged, throwing her arms around him, holding tight. The sinuous black thing wrapped around her legs, undulated, getting a stronger grip on her. She screamed as it squeezed. Richard yanked the sword free, filling the air with its ringing. The green light began to glow around them as they were dragged in. Anger flooded through him. Richard's worst fear was coming to pass. Something was trying to take Kaylin. The green light brightened. Being hauled across the ground, he couldn't reach the thing that pulled them. Kaylin held him hard by the waist. Her legs were too far away, and the thing that held her legs was farther still. Kaylin, let go of me! She was too terrified to do it. She clutched him tightly, desperately, panting in pain. The green sheet came up as they were dragged in. The buzzing was loud in his ears. Let go, he yelled again. He tried to pry her hands from his waist. The trees of the bog started to fade into darkness. Richard could feel the pressure of the wall. He couldn't believe how strongly she held him. On his back, sliding across the ground, he tried to reach behind himself to pull her wrists away from him, but could not. Their only chance was for him to get up. Page 143. Kalen, you have to let go or we're dead. I won't let them get you. Trust me. Let go. He didn't know if he was telling her the truth, but he was sure it was their only chance. Her head pressed against his stomach as she clutched his body. Kaylin looked up at him, her face contorting in pain as the black thing squeezed. She screamed, then let go. In a blink, Richard was on his feet. As he jumped up, the dark wall materialized abruptly in front of him. His father reached out. He unleashed his rage, swinging the sword with every fiber of violence he possessed. The blade swept through the barrier, through the thing he knew wasn't his father. The dark shape wailed, exploding in a cloud of nothingness. Kalen's feet were at the wall. The dark thing enfolded tightly around her legs, compressing and pulling. He brought the sword up. Murderous need surged through him. Richard, no, it's my sister. He knew it wasn't, just as it wasn't his father. He gave himself over completely to the hot need and brought the sword down as hard as he could. Again, it swept through the wall, slashed through the repulsive thing that held Kalen. There was a confusion of flashes, unearthly wailing and keening. Kaylin's legs were free. She lay sprawled on her stomach. Without looking to see what else was happening, Richard pushed his arm under her waist and lifted her in a single motion, scooping her off the ground. He held her tight against himself and held the sword toward the wall as he retreated from the boundary. Backing away steadily, he watched for any movement, any aggression. They left the green light. He kept going until they were well clear beyond the horses. When he stopped at last and released her, Kaylin turned and threw her arms around him, shaking. He had to struggle to restrain the rage that urged him to go back in and attack. He knew he would have to put the sword away to quell the anger, the need, but he didn't dare to. 
The others, where are they? She asked in a panic. We have to find them. Kaylin pushed away from him and started to run back. Richard snatched her by the wrist, almost yanking her from her feet. Stay here, he yelled, far more angrily than required, pushing her to the ground. Richard found Zed in a heap, unconscious. As he bent to the old man, something swept out in a rush over his head. His anger erupted. He spun with the sword, the blade sweeping through the dark form. The stump reeled back into the boundary with a shrill screeching, the severed part vaporizing in midair. Richard picked up Zed with one arm, threw him over his shoulder like a sack of grain, and carried him to Kalin, where he laid him gently on the ground. She held the wizard's head in her lap, inspecting for wounds. Richard ducked low as he ran back, but the expected attack didn't come. He wished it would. He longed for the fight, hungered to strike. He found Chase jammed partway under a log. Richard seized the mail and pulled him over. Blood oozed from a gash on the side of Chase's head. Debris was stuck to the wound. Richard's mind raced, trying to think what to do. He couldn't lift Chase with one arm, and he didn't dare to put the sword away. He did know he didn't want Kalen to come help. He wanted her to stay safely away. Getting a good grip on the warden's leather tunic, Richard started dragging him. The slick bog weed eased the effort somewhat, but it was still difficult because he had to go around several fallen trees. Surprisingly, nothing attacked. Maybe he had hurt it or killed it. He wondered if it was possible to kill something already dead. The sword had magic. Richard wasn't sure what it was capable of. He wasn't even sure if the things in the boundary were dead. He finally reached Kalin and Zed and dragged Chase close. The wizard was still unconscious. Kalin's face was white with worry. What are we going to do? Richard scanned around. We can't stay here and we can't leave them. Let's put them over the horses and get out of here. We'll look to their wounds as soon as we're a safe distance away. The clouds were thicker than before, and mist covered everything with a wet sheen. As he checked in every direction, Richard put the sword away and easily lifted Zed over his horse. Chase was more difficult. He was big, and all his weapons were heavy. Blood throbbed from the wound on the side of his forehead, soaking his hair, and hanging him over the side of the horse made it bleed more. Richard decided he couldn't leave it untended. He quickly retrieved an alm leaf and a strip of cloth from a pack. He crumpled the leaf to make it seep its healing fluid, pressed it against the wound, and had Kalin wrap the cloth around Chase's head. The cloth soaked through almost immediately, but he knew the alm leaf would stop the bleeding in a short time. Richard helped Kalin up onto her horse. He could tell that her legs hurt more than she would admit. He gave her the reins of Zed's horse, mounted up, took Chase's horse, and then carefully got his bearings. He knew they would have a hard time finding the trail. The mist was getting heavy visibility limited. There seemed to be ghosts watching from the shadows in every direction. He didn't know if he should lead or follow Kalin, didn't know how best to protect her, so he rode beside her. Zed and Chase weren't tied down and could easily slip off the horses, so they had to take it slow. The dead spruce looked the same in every direction, and they couldn't go in a straight line because they had to cut back and forth around fallen trees. Richard spat out mosquitoes that kept flying into his mouth. The sky was the same dark steel gray everywhere. There was no chance to tell where the sun was to get oriented. After a time, Richard wasn't at all sure they were going in the right direction. It seemed they should have reached the trail already. He took fixes from landmark trees, and when they reached each one, he would pick a new one farther ahead, hoping they were traveling in a straight line. To do it properly, he knew he had to be able to line up at least three trees to make sure the line of travel was straight, but he couldn't see that far in the mist. He couldn't be sure he wasn't leading them in circles. Even if he was going in a straight line, he wasn't sure the direction was toward the trail. Are you sure we're going the right way? Kalin asked. It all looks the same. No, but at least we haven't run into the boundary. Do you think we should stop and tend to them? We don't dare. For all I know, we could be ten feet from the underworld. Kalin looked around, worried. Richard gave thought to having her wait with the other two while he went ahead and scouted for the trail, but dismissed the idea, as he was afraid he might not be able to find her again. They had to stay together. He started to wonder what they would do if they couldn't find their way out before dark. How would they protect themselves against the heart hounds? If there were enough of them, even the sword couldn't hold them all off at once. Chase had said they had to get to the swamp before nightfall. He hadn't said why or how the swamp could protect them. The brown bog weed was an endless sea all around with hulks of trees aground in it everywhere. 
An oak appeared off to their left, then some more, some with leaves shimmering dark green and wet in the mist. This was not the way they had come in. Richard turned them to the right a little, following the edge of the dead bog, hoping it would lead them back to the trail. Shadows from the brush among the oaks watched them. He told himself it was his imagination that made the shadows seem to have eyes. There was no wind, no movement, no sound. He was angry with himself for being lost, despite how easily it could happen in this place. He was a guide. Getting lost was unforgivable. Richard breathed out in relief when he saw the trail at last. They quickly dismounted and checked their two charges. There was no change in Zed, but at least Chase's wound had stopped bleeding. Richard had no idea what to do for them. He didn't know if they had been knocked unconscious or if their condition was caused by some sort of magic from the boundary. Kalen didn't know either. What do you think we should do? she asked him. Richard tried not to look as worried as he really was. Chase said we had to get to the swamp or the hounds would get us. It won't do them any good to be laid out here intended to while we wait for them to wake, only to have the hounds get us all. As I see it, we have only two choices. Leave them here or take them with us. There is no way I'm leaving them. Let's tie them down on the horses so they don't fall off and get to the swamp. Kalen agreed. They worked quickly to lash their friends to the horses. Richard changed Chase's bandage and cleaned up the wound a little. The mist was changing to a light rain. He fished around in the packs, finding the blankets, and removed the oilcloth they were wrapped in. They put a blanket over each friend, then covered them with the oilcloth to keep them dry, crisscrossing rope over it all to hold it in place. When they were finished, Kaylin unexpectedly put her arms around him, hugging him close and tight for a moment, separating before he could return her gesture. Thank you for saving me, she said softly. The boundary terrifies me. She looked sheepishly up at him. And if you remind me what I said about not coming after me, I'll kick you. She smiled as she looked up from under her eyebrows. Not a word, I promise. He smiled back at her and pulled up the hood of her cloak, stuffing her hair into it to keep her dry in the rain. He pulled up his own hood, and they started off down the road. The woods were deserted. Rain dripped down through the tangle overhead. Branches reached around the trail like talons, reaching to snatch both people and horses. Even without their rider's direction, the horses trotted their way carefully down the center of the road, their ears pricking from one side to the other as if listening to the shadows. So dense was the thicket to each side that there was no chance they could take to the trees if they had to. Kalen drew her cloak tighter. It was go on or go back, and there was no going back. They rode the horses hard the rest of the afternoon and evening. When the day's death began stealing away the soft gray light, they still had not reached the swamp, and there was no way to tell how much farther it was. Off through the tangled woods, they caught the sound of howling, their breath caught in their throats. The heart hounds were coming. Chapter 15 The horses needed no encouragement to run. They fled down the road at full speed, their riders making no attempt to slow them the howls of the heart hounds energizing the effort. Water and mud splashed as their hooves pounded the road, and rain ran in rivulets across their hides, but it was the mud that won out, streaking and caking on their legs and bellies. When the hounds shrieked, the horses returned a snort of fear. Richard let Kalen take the lead, wanting to stay between her and their pursuers. The sounds of the heart hounds were still distant off toward the boundary, but he knew by the way they were angling in from the left that it was only a matter of time until they would be overtaken. If they could turn to the right and head away from the boundary, there was a chance they could outrun the hounds, but the woods were thick, impenetrable. It would be slow going if they could find an opening, a sure death if they tried. Their only chance was to stay on the road and reach the swamp before they were caught. Richard didn't know how far it was or what they would do once they reached it, only that they had to. The colors of day were washing out into a sullen gray as night approached. Rain pelted his face in small cold pricks, heated and mingled with sweat, and ran down his neck. Richard watched the bodies of his two friends bounce and jostle on the horses, hoping they were tied down securely enough, hoping they were not badly hurt, hoping they would be conscious soon. The ride couldn't be doing them any good. Kalen didn't turn or look back. She bent to her task, her dark form hunched forward over the horse as it ran. The road curved back and forth as it threaded its way around imposing misshapen oaks and rock outcroppings. Dead trees became more infrequent. 
Leaves of the oak, ash, and maple trees sealed the riders away from the last vestiges of the sky, darkening the trail even more. The hounds were getting closer when the road began to descend into a sodden wood of cedar. A good sign, Richard thought. Cedar often grew where the ground was wet. Kaylin's horse disappeared over the edge of a drop. Richard reached the brink of the sharp slope and saw her again descending into a bowl in the earth. The tangled tops of trees spread out into the distance, at least as much of it as he could see in the mist and dim light. It was the Scowl Swamp at last. The smell of wet and rot assailed him as he followed her in a rush down through swirling trailers of mist that moved and spun at their passing. Sharp calls and hoots came from the dense vegetation. The howls of the heart hounds came from behind, closer now. Woody vines hung from slick, twisted limbs of trees that stood in the water on roots, looking like claws, and smaller leafy vines spiraled around anything strong enough to hold them. Everything seemed to be growing on top of something else, seeking to gain an advantage. Water, dark and still, sat in stagnant expanses, sneaking in under clumps of bushes, enveloping stands of fat-bottomed trees. Duckweed drifted in thick mats on the water, looking like manicured lawn. The lush growth seemed to swallow the sound of their horses' hooves, allowing only the native calls to echo across the waters. The road narrowed into a trail that struggled to remain above the black water, making it necessary to slow the horses for fear they would break a leg on the roots. Richard saw that as Kalin's horse passed, the surface of the water rolled in lazy ripples as things moved under it. He heard the hounds at the top of the bowl. Kalin turned at the howls. If they stayed on the trail, the hounds would be at them in a matter of minutes. As Richard looked around, he pulled the sword free. It sent its distinctive ringing across the murky water. Kalin stopped and looked back to him. There! He pointed with the sword across the water to their right. That island! It looks high enough to be dry. Maybe the heart hounds can't swim. He thought it a slim hope, but could think of nothing else. Chase had said they would be safe from the hounds in the swamp, but hadn't told them how. This was the only thing he could think of. Kaylin didn't hesitate. She led her horse right in, pulling Zed's behind. Richard followed close after with chases, watching up the trail, seeing movement through gaps in the trees. The water seemed to be no more than three or four feet deep with a muddy bottom. Weed broke from its anchoring and floated to the surface as Kaylin's horse waded through ahead of him, making steady progress to the island. Then he saw the snakes. Dark bodies wriggled in the water just below the surface, heading toward them from every direction. Some lifted their heads, flicking red tongues out into the damp air. Their dark brown bodies had copper-colored splotches, almost invisible in the gloomy water, and barely disturbed the surface as they swam. Richard had never seen snakes this big. Kalin was watching the island and hadn't noticed them yet. The dry land was too far away. He knew they weren't going to make it before the snakes reached them. Richard turned and looked behind to see if they could make it back to high ground. Where they had left the trail, the dark shapes of the heart hounds were gathered, snarling and growling. Heads held low, the big black bodies paced back and forth, wanting to enter the water to reach their prey, but only howling instead. Richard lowered the tip of the sword into the water, letting it drag a small wake behind as he prepared to strike at the first snake that came close enough. Then a surprising thing happened. When the sword dipped into the water, the snakes turned suddenly and squirmed away as fast as they could go. Somehow the magic in the sword frightened them away. He wasn't sure why the magic would function this way, but was glad it did. They worked their way among the large trunks of trees that stood like columns in the mire. Each in turn brushed aside vines and streamers of moss as they passed. When they crossed shallower areas of water, the tip of his sword no longer reached the water. The snakes returned immediately. He leaned lower, the sword's tip dipping back in the water, and the snakes turned once more, wanting nothing to do with them. Richard wondered what would happen when they reached dry land. Would the snakes follow them there? Would the sword's magic work to keep them away out of the water? The snakes might be as much trouble as the heart hounds. Water ran off the underside of Kalin's horse as it climbed up onto the island. There were a few poplar trees at the high point in the center and cedars at the water's edge on the far side of the small hump of dry ground, but mostly it was covered with reed and a smattering of iris. To see what would happen, Richard took the sword from the water before he needed to. The snakes began to come for him. 
When he left the water, some turned and swam away, some wandered the shoreline, but none followed onto dry land. In near darkness, Richard laid Zed and Chase on the ground beneath the poplars. He pulled a tarp from the packs and strung it between the trees to make a small shelter. Everything was wet, but since there was no wind, the makeshift structure kept most of the rain off them. There was no chance of a fire, for now, since all the wood that could be found was thoroughly soaked. At least the night wasn't cold. Frogs kept up a steady chirping from the wet darkness. Richard placed a pair of fat candles on a piece of wood so they could have some light under their shelter. Together they checked Zed. There didn't seem to be any sign of an injury, but he remained unconscious. Chase's condition was unchanged, too. Kalin stroked Zed's forehead. It is not a good sign for a wizard's eyes to be closed like this. I don't know what to do for them. Richard shook his head. Neither do I. We can be glad they don't have a fever. Maybe there's a healer in South Haven. I'll make litters the horses can pull. I think that would be better than having them ride again the way they did today. Kalin retrieved two more blankets to keep their friends warm. Then she and Richard sat together by the candles, the water dripping around them. Glowing pairs of yellow eyes waited on the trail in the blackness back through the trees. As the harthounds paced, the eyes moved back and forth. Occasionally, Richard and Kalin heard yelps of frustration. The two of them watched their hunters off across the dark water. Kalin stared at the glowing eyes. I wonder why they didn't follow us. Richard glanced sideways at her. I think they're afraid of the snakes. Kaylin jumped to her feet, quickly scanning around, her head pushing against the tarp. Snakes? What snakes? I don't like snakes, she said in a rush. He looked up. Some kind of big water snakes. They swam off when I put the sword in the water. I don't think we have to worry. They didn't come up on the dry ground when we did. I think it's safe. She looked around cautiously as she pulled her cloak tight and then sat down, closer to him this time. You could have warned me about them, she said with a frown. I didn't know myself until I saw them, and the hounds were right behind us. I didn't think we had much choice in the matter, and I didn't want to scare you. She didn't say anything more. Richard got out a sausage and a loaf of hard bread, their last one. He tore the bread in half and cut pieces off the sausage, handing her a few. They each held a tin cup under the rainwater that dripped off the tarp. They ate in silence, watching all around for any sign of threat, listening to the rhythm of the rain. Richard, she asked at last, did you see my sister in the boundary? No. Whatever it was that had you didn't look like a person to me, and I would bet that the thing I struck down at first didn't look like my father to you. She shook her head that it didn't. I think, he said, they just appear in a form meant to recreate a person you want to see, to beguile you. I think you're right she sighed, taking a bite of sausage. When she finished chewing, she added, I'm glad. I would hate to think we had to hurt them. He nodded his agreement and looked over. Her hair was wet, and some of it was stuck to the side of her face. There's something else, though, that I think is odd. When that thing from the boundary, whatever it was, struck out at Chase, it was fast, and it hit him square the first time. And before we could do anything, it grabbed you with no trouble. Same with Zed. It got him the first time. But when I went back for them, it tried for me and missed. Then it didn't even try again. I noticed that when it happened, she said. It missed you by a good distance. It was as if it didn't know where you were. It knew right where the three of us were, but it couldn't seem to find you. Richard thought a moment. Maybe it was the sword. Kalin shrugged. Whatever it was, I am happy for it. He wasn't at all sure it was the sword. The snakes had been afraid of the sword and swam away from it. The thing in the boundary had shown no fear. It seemed as if it simply couldn't find him. There was one other thing that he wondered at. When he had struck down the thing in the boundary that looked like his father, he had felt no pain. Zed had told him there would be a price to pay for killing with the sword, and that he would feel the pain of what he had done. Maybe there was no pain because the thing was already dead. Maybe it was all in his head. None of it was real. That couldn't be. It was real enough to strike down his friends. His self-assurance that it wasn't his father he had cut down began to waver. They ate the rest of the meal in silence while he thought about what he could do for Zed and Chase, which was nothing. Zed had medicines along, but only Zed knew how to use them. Maybe it was magic from the boundary that had struck them down. Zed had magic along, too, but he was also the only one who knew how to use that. 
Richard took out an apple and cut it into wedges, removed the seeds, and gave half to Kalen. She moved closer and leaned her head on his arm as she ate it. Tired? he asked. She nodded, then smiled. And I am sore in places I cannot mention. She ate another wedge of apple. Do you know anything about South Haven? I've heard other guides mention it when they've passed through Heartland. From what they say, it's a place of thieves and misfits. It doesn't sound like the kind of place that would have a healer. Richard didn't answer. What will we do then? I don't know. But they'll get better. They'll be all right. And if not, she pressed. He took the apple away from his mouth and looked at her. Kalen, what are you trying to say? I am saying that we have to be prepared to leave them, to go on. We can't, he answered firmly. We need them both. Remember when Zed gave me the sword? He said he wanted me to get us across the boundary. He said he had a plan. He hasn't told me what that plan is. He looked out over the water at the hounds. We need them, he repeated. She picked at the skin of the apple wedge. What if they were to die tonight? Then what would we do? We would have to go on. Richard knew she was looking up at him, but he didn't look back. He understood her need to stop Rawl. He felt the same hunger and would let nothing stop them, even if it meant leaving his friends. But it hadn't reached that point yet. He knew she was only trying to reassure herself that he had the necessary conviction, the required determination. She had given up much to her mission, lost much to Rawl, as he had. She wanted to know he had the ability to go on, at any cost, to lead. The candles lit her face softly, a small glow in the darkness. Reflections of the flames danced in her eyes. He knew she didn't like saying these things to him. Kalen, I'm the seeker. I understand the weight of that responsibility. I will do anything required to stop Dark and Rawl, anything. You can place your faith in that. I will not, however, spend the lives of my friends easily. For now, we have enough to worry about. Let's not invent new things. Rain dripped into the water from trees, sending hollow echoes through the darkness. She put her hand on his arm as if to say she was sorry. He knew she had nothing to be sorry for. She was only trying to face the truth, one possible truth anyway. He wanted to reassure her. If they don't get better, he said, holding her eyes with his, and if there is a safe place to leave them with someone we can trust, then we will do so and go on. She nodded. That is all I meant. I know. He finished his apple. Why don't you get some sleep? I'll keep watch. I couldn't sleep, she said, indicating the hard hounds with a nod of her head. Not with them watching us like that. Or with snakes all around. Richard smiled at her. All right. Then how about if you help me build the litters for the horses to pull? That way we can get out of here in the morning as soon as the hounds are gone. She returned the smile and got up. Richard retrieved a wicked-looking war axe from Chase and found it worked as well on wood as on flesh and bone. He wasn't at all sure Chase would approve of putting one of his prize weapons to use in this fashion. In fact, he knew he wouldn't. He smiled to himself. He couldn't wait to tell him. In his mind, he could picture his big friend's disapproving frown. Of course, Chase would have to embellish the story with every telling. To Chase, a story without embellishment was like meat without gravy, just plain dry. His friends had to get better, he told himself. They just had to. He couldn't bear it if they died. It was several hours before they were finished. Kalen stayed close to him, as she was afraid of the snakes, and the hard hounds watched them the whole time. For a while, Richard had thought to use Chase's crossbow to try to get some of the hounds, but finally decided against it. Chase would be angry at him for squandering valuable bolts to no purpose. The hounds couldn't get them and would be gone with the light. When they were finished, they checked the other two, then sat down together again by the candles. He knew Kalen was tired. He could hardly keep his own eyes open. But she still didn't want to lie down to sleep, so he had her lean against him. In no time her breathing slowed and she was asleep. It was a fitful sleep. He could tell she was having bad dreams. When she started whimpering and jerking, he woke her. She was breathing rapidly and almost in tears. Nightmares? he asked, stroking her hair reassuringly with the backs of his fingers. Kalen nodded against him. I was dreaming about the thing from the boundary that was around my legs. I dreamt it was a big snake. Richard put his arm around her shoulders and hugged her tight against him. She didn't object, but pulled her knees up and put her arms around them as she nuzzled against him. He worried that she could hear his heart pounding. 
If she did, she didn't say anything and was soon fast asleep again. He listened to her breathing, to the frogs, and to the rain. She slept peacefully. He closed his fingers around the tooth under his shirt. He watched the heart hounds. They watched back. She woke sometime near morning when it was still dark. Richard was so tired he had a headache. Kalin insisted he lie down and sleep while she kept watch. He didn't want to. He wanted to continue holding her, but was too sleepy to argue. When she gently shook him awake, it was morning. Weak, gray light filtered through the dark green of the swamp and through heavy mist that made the world seem small and close. The water around them looked as if it had been steeped with decayed vegetation, a brew that rippled occasionally with unseen life beneath the surface. Unblinking black eyes pushed up through the duckweed, watching them. The heart hounds are gone, she said. She looked drier than she had last night. How long, he asked, rubbing the cramps out of his arms. Twenty, maybe thirty minutes. When it got light, they suddenly went off in a rush. Kalin gave him a tin cup of hot tea. Richard gave her a questioning look. She smiled. I held it over the candle until it was hot. He was surprised at her inventiveness. She gave him a piece of dried fruit and ate some herself. He noticed the war axe leaning against her leg and thought to himself that she knew how to stand watch. It was still raining gently. Strange birds called out sharply and rapid, ragged shrieks from across the swamp, while others answered in the distance. Bugs hovered inches above the water, and occasionally there was an unseen splash. Any change in Zed or Chase, he asked. She seemed reluctant to answer. Zed's breathing is slower. Richard quickly went and checked. Zed seemed hardly alive. His face had a sunken, ashen look. He put an ear to the old man's chest and found his heart to be beating normally, but he was breathing slower, and he felt cold and clammy. I think we must be safe from the hounds now. We had better get going and see if we can find them some help, he said. Richard knew she was afraid of the snakes. He was, too, and told her so, but she didn't let it interfere with what they had to do. She put her trust in what he said, that the snakes wouldn't come near the sword and cross the water without hesitation when he told her to go. They had to traverse the water twice, once with Zed and Chase, and a second time to retrieve the parts for the litters, as they could only be used on dry land. They hooked up the poles to the horses, but couldn't use them yet as the tangle of roots on the swamp trail would cause too jolting a ride. They would have to wait until they were on a better road, once they were clear of the swamp. It was mid-morning before they reached the better road. They stopped long enough to lay their two fallen friends in the litters and cover them with blankets and oilcloth. Richard was pleased to discover that the pole arrangement worked well. It didn't slow them at all, and the mud helped them slide along nicely. He and Kalin ate lunch on their horses, passing food back and forth as they rode next to each other. They stopped only to check on Zed and Chase and continued on through the rain. Before night came, they reached South Haven. The town was little more than a collection of ramshackle buildings and houses fit crookedly in among the oaks and beach, almost as if to turn themselves away from the road, from queries, from righteous eyes. None looked ever to have seen paint. Some had tin patches that drummed in the steady rain. Set in the center of the huddle was a supply store, and next to it a two-story building. A clumsily carved sign proclaimed it to be an inn, but offered no name. Yellow lamplight coming from windows downstairs was the only color standing out from the grayness of the day in the building. Heaps of garbage leaned drunkenly against the side of the building, and the house next door tilted in sympathy with the rubbish pile. Stay close to me, Richard said as they dismounted. The men here are dangerous. Kalin smiled oddly with one side of her mouth. I'm used to their kind. Richard wondered what that meant, but didn't ask. Talking trailed off when they went through the door, and all faces turned. The place was about what Richard expected. Oil lamps lit a room filled with a fog of pungent pipe smoke. Tables, all arranged in a haphazard fashion, were rough, some no more than planks on barrels. There were no chairs, only benches. To the left, a door stood closed, probably leading to the kitchen. To the right, in the shadows leading up to the guest rooms, was a stairway minus a handrail. The floor, with a series of paths through the litter, was mottled with dark stains and spills. The men were a rough collection of trappers and travelers and trouble. Many had unkempt beards. Most were big. The place smelled of ale and smoke and sweat. 
Kaylin stood tall and proud next to him. She was a person not easily intimidated. Richard reasoned that perhaps she should be. She stuck out among the riffraff like a gold ring on a beggar. Her bearing made the room even more of an embarrassment. When she pushed back the hood of her cloak, grins broke out all around, revealing a collection of crooked and missing teeth. The hungry looks in the men's eyes didn't fit the smiles. Richard wished Chase were awake. With a sinking feeling, he realized there was going to be trouble. A stout man walked over and halted. He wore a shirt with no sleeves and an apron that looked like it could never have been white. The top of his shiny, shaved head reflected the lamplight, and the curly black hair on his thick arms seemed in competition with his beard. He wiped his hands on a filthy rag before flopping it over a shoulder. Something I can do for you? The man asked in a dry voice. His tongue rolled a toothpick across his mouth as he waited. With his own tone and eyes, Richard let the man know he would brook no trouble. There a healer in this town? The proprietor shifted his glance to Kalen and then back to Richard. No. Richard noted the way, unlike the other men, the man kept his eyes where they belonged when he looked at Kalen. It told him something important. Then we would like a room. He lowered his voice. We have two friends outside who are hurt. Taking the toothpick out of his mouth, the man folded his arms. I don't need any trouble. Nor do I, Richard said with deliberate menace. The bald man looked Richard up and down, his eyes snagging for an instant on the sword. With his arms still folded, he appraised Richard's eyes. How many rooms you want? I'm pretty full. One will do fine. In the center of the room, a big man stood. From a mass of long, stringy red hair, he looked out with mean eyes that were set too close together. The front of his thick beard was wet with ale. He wore a wolf hide over one shoulder. His hand rested on the handle of a long knife. Expensive-looking whore you got there, boy, the red-haired man said. I don't suppose you'd mind if we came up to your room and passed her around some? Richard locked his glare on the man. He knew this was a challenge that would only be ended with blood. His eyes didn't move. His hand did, slowly, toward the sword. His rage pounded, fully awake even before his fingers reached the hilt. This was the day he was going to have to kill other men. A lot of other men. Richard's grip tightened around the braided wire hilt until his knuckles were white. Kalen gave a steady pull on the sleeve of his sword arm. She spoke his name in a low tone, raising the inflection at the end the way his mother did when she was warning him to stay out of something. He stole a glance at her. She gave a luscious smile to the red-haired man. You men have it all wrong, she said in a throaty voice. You see, this is my day off. I'm the one who hired him for the night. She smacked Richard on the rear, hard. It surprised him so much he froze. She licked her top lip as she looked at the red-haired man. But if he doesn't give me my money's worth, well, you will be the first I call to fill the breach. She smiled lasciviously. There was a thick moment of silence. Richard resisted mightily his need to pull the sword free. He held his breath as he waited to see which way it was going to go. Kalen continued to smile at the men in a way that only made his anger deepen. Life and death measured each other in the red-haired man's eyes. No one moved. Then a grin split his face and he roared with laughter. Everyone else hooted and hollered and laughed. The man sat down and the men started talking again, ignoring Richard and Kalen. Richard breathed out in a sigh. The proprietor eased the two of them back a ways. He gave Kalen a smile of respect. Thank you, ma'am. I'm glad your head is faster than your friend's hand. This place may not seem much to you, but it's mine, and you just kept it in one piece for me. You are welcome, Kalen said. Do you have a room for us? The proprietor put the toothpick back in the corner of his mouth. There's one upstairs at the end of the hall on the right that has a bolt on the door. We have two friends outside, Richard said. I could use some help getting them up there. The man gave a nod of his head back at the room full of men. It wouldn't do if that lot saw you were burdened with injured companions. You two go up to the room just like they expect. My son's in the kitchen. We'll bring your friends up the back stairs and no one will see. Richard didn't like the idea. Have a little faith, my friend, the other said in a low voice, or you may be bringing harm to your friends. By the way, my name's Bill. Richard looked at Kalen. Her face was unreadable. He looked back to the proprietor. The man was tough, hardened, but didn't appear to be devious. 
Still, it was his friends' lives at stake. He tried to keep his voice from sounding as threatening as he felt. All right, Bill. We will do as you ask. Bill gave a small smile and a nod as he rolled the toothpick across his mouth. Richard and Kalen went up to the room and waited. The ceiling was lower than was comfortable. The wall next to the single bed was covered with years of spit. In the opposite corner were a three-legged table and a short bench. A single oil lamp sat glowing weakly on the table. The windowless room was otherwise bare and had a naked feel to it. It smelled rank. Richard paced while Kalen sat on the bed watching him, looking slightly uncomfortable. Finally, he strode over to her. I can't believe what you did down there. She stood up and looked him in the eyes. The result is what matters, Richard. If I had let you do what you were about to do, your life would have been at great risk, for nothing of value. But those men think... And you care what those men think? No, but... He could feel his face redden. I am sworn to protect the life of the Seeker with my own. I would do anything required to protect you. She gave him a meaningful look, lifting an eyebrow. Anything. Frustrated, he tried to think how to put into words how angry he was without making it sound as if he was angry with her. He had been at the brink of lethal commitment, a brink only one wrong word away. Pulling back was agonizingly difficult. He could still feel his blood pounding with the lust for violence. It was difficult to understand the way the anger twisted his own rationality with hot need, much less explain it to her. Looking into her green eyes was making him relax, though, cooling his anger. Richard, you have to keep your mind where it belongs. What do you mean? Dark and raw. That is where your mind belongs. Those men downstairs are of no concern to us. We must only get past them, that's all. Nothing else. Don't expend your thoughts on them. It's a waste. Put your energy to our job. He let out a breath and nodded. You're right, I'm sorry. You did a brave thing tonight, as much as I didn't like it. She put her arms around him, her head against his chest, and gave him a slow hug. There was a soft knock at the door. After assuring himself it was Bill, he opened the door. The proprietor and his son carried Chase in and laid him carefully on the floor. When the son, a lanky young man, saw Kalen, he fell instantly and hopelessly in love. Richard understood the feeling. Nonetheless, he didn't appreciate it. Bill pointed with his thumb. This is my son, Randy. Randy was in a trance, staring at Kalen. Bill turned to Richard, wiping the rain off the top of his head with the rag he kept over his shoulder. He still had the toothpick in his mouth. You didn't tell me your friend was Dale Branstone. Richard's caution flared. That a problem? Bill smiled. Not with me. The warden and me have had our disagreements, but he's a fair man. He gives me no trouble. He stays here sometimes when he's in the area on official business, but the men downstairs would tear him apart if they knew he was up here. They might try, Richard corrected. A slight smile curled the corners of Bill's mouth. We'll get the other one. When they left, Richard gave Kalen two silver coins. When they come back, give the boy one of these to take the horses to the stables for us and tend to them. Tell him that if he will spend the night watching them and have them ready for us at sunrise, you will add the other. What makes you think you will do it? Richard gave a short laugh. Don't worry, he'll do it if you ask. Just smile. Bill came back, carrying Zed in his husky arms. Randy followed, carrying most of their packs. Bill gently laid the old man on the floor next to Chase. He gave Richard a look from under his curly eyebrows, then turned to his son. Randy... Go get this young lady a basin and a pitcher of water. And a towel. A clean towel. She might like to clean up. Randy backed out of the room, smiling and tripping over his feet as he went. Bill watched him go, then turned to Richard with an intense look. He took the toothpick out of his mouth. These two are in bad shape. I won't ask you what happened to them because a smart fellow wouldn't tell me, and I think you're a smart fellow. We don't have a healer around here, but there's someone who may be able to help. A woman named Addie. They call her the Bone Woman. Most people are afraid of her. That bunch downstairs won't go near her place. Richard remembered Chase saying Addie was his friend. He frowned. Why? Bill glanced to Kalen and back to Richard, narrowing his eyes. Because they're superstitious. They think she's bad luck of some sort and because she lives near the boundary. They say that people she doesn't like have a bad habit of dropping dead. Mind you, I'm not saying it's true. I don't believe it myself. 
I think it's all made up in their own heads. She's not a healer, but I know of folks she's helped. She may be able to help your friends. At least you better hope she can, because they're not going to last much longer without help. Richard combed his fingers through his hair. How do we find this bone woman? Turn left down the trail in front of the stables. It's about a four-hour ride. And why are you helping us? Richard asked. Bill smiled and folded his muscled arms across his chest. Let's just say I'm helping the warden. He keeps some of my other customers at bay, and the wardens bring me an income from the government with their business, here and from my dry goods store next door. If he makes it, you just be sure to tell him it was me that helped save his life. He chuckled. That'll vex him good. Richard smiled. He understood Bill's meaning. Chase hated to have anyone help him. Bill did indeed know Chase. I will be sure to let him know you saved his life. The other looked pleased. Now, since this bone woman lives by herself, way out by the boundary, and I'm to ask for her help, I think it would be a good idea if I took her some things. Can you get together a load of supplies for her? Sure. I'm an approved supplier. I get reimbursed from Heartland. Of course, that thieving council takes most of it back in taxes. I can put it in my tally book for the government to pay if this is official business. It is. Randy came back with the basin, water, and towels. Kalen put a silver coin in his hand and asked him about caring for the horses. He looked to his father for approval. Bill nodded. Just tell me which horse is yours and I'll take extra good care of it, Randy said with a big grin. Kalen smiled back. They are all mine. Take care with each. My life depends on it. Randy got a serious look on his face. You can count on me. Unable to decide what to do with his hands, he finally jammed them in his pockets. I won't let anyone near them. He backed toward the door again, and when all but his head was through it, added, I just want you to know I don't believe a word of what those men downstairs are saying about you, and I told them so. Kaylin smiled in spite of herself. Thank you, but I do not want you to endanger yourself on my account. Please stay away from those men, and do not mention that you talk to me. It will only embolden them. Randy grinned and nodded and left. Bill rolled his eyes and shook his head. He turned to Kalen with a smile. You wouldn't consider staying here and marrying the boy, would you? It would do him good to have a mate. An odd look of pain and panic flashed across Kalen's eyes. She sat on the bed looking down at the floor. Just kidding, girl, Bill said apologetically. He turned back to Richard. I'll bring you each a plate of supper, boiled potatoes and meat. Meat? Richard asked suspiciously. Bill chuckled. Don't worry, I wouldn't dare serve those men bad meat. I could lose my head. In a few minutes, he returned and set two steaming dishes of food on the table. Thank you for your help, Richard said. Bill raised an eyebrow. Don't worry, it will all be in my tally book. I'll bring it to you in the morning to sign. There anyone in Heartland who will recognize your signature? Richard smiled. I think so. My name is Richard Cipher. My brother is first counselor. Bill flinched, suddenly shaken. I'm sorry, N not that your brother is first counselor. I mean that I'm sorry I didn't know. I mean that if I had known, I'd have given you better accommodations. You can stay at my house. It's not much, but it's better than this. I'll take your things over right now. Bill, it's all right. Richard went to the man and put a hand on his back, reassuring him. The proprietor looked suddenly less fierce. My brother is first counselor. I am not. The room is fine. Everything is fine. You sure? Everything? You're not going to send the army here, are you? You've been a big help to us, honest. I have nothing to do with the army. Bill didn't look convinced. You're with the head of the boundary wardens. Richard smiled warmly. He's a friend of mine for many years. The old man, too. They're my friends, that's all. Bill's eyes brightened. Well, if that's true, then how about if I add a couple extra rooms to the tally book? Seeing as how they won't know you all stayed together. Richard kept smiling and patted the man's back. That would be wrong. I won't put my name to it. Breathing out with a sigh, Bill broke into a big grin. So you are Chase's friend, he nodded to himself. Now I believe you. I haven't been able to get that man to fatten my tally book in all the time I've known him. Richard put some silver in the man's hand. But this wouldn't be wrong. I appreciate what you're doing for us. I would also appreciate it if you would water the ale tonight. Drunken men die too easy. Bill gave a knowing smile. Then Richard added, You have dangerous customers. The man studied Richard's eyes, glanced to Kalen, then back again. 
Tonight I do, he agreed. Richard gave him a hard look. If anyone comes through that door tonight, I will kill him, no questions asked. Bill looked at him for a long moment. I'll see what I can do to keep that from happening, even if I have to knock some heads together. He went to the door. Eat your supper before it gets cold. And take care of your lady. She has a good head on her shoulders. He turned to Kalen and winked. And a pretty one, too. One more thing, Bill. The boundary is failing. It will be down in a few weeks. Take care with yourself. The man's chest rose as he took a deep breath. He held the doorknob as he looked into Richard's eyes for a long moment. I think the council named the wrong brother first counselor. But then they didn't get to be counselors because they worry about doing right. I'll come get you in the morning when the sun is up and it's safe. When he left, Richard and Kalen sat close on the small bench and ate their meal. Their room was at the back of the building, and the men downstairs were at the front, so it was quieter than Richard thought it would be. All they could hear from the crowd was a muffled hum. The food was better than Richard expected, or maybe it was just that he was famished. The bed looked wonderful to him, too, as he was dead tired. Kalen noticed. You only had an hour or two of sleep last night. I will stand first watch. If the men downstairs decide to come up here, it will not be until later that they work up the courage. If they come, it would be better if you were rested. Easier to kill people when you're well rested? He was immediately sorry it came out the way it did. He hadn't meant it to sound harsh. He realized he was gripping his fork as if it were a sword. I'm sorry, Richard. I didn't mean it that way. I only meant I don't want you to get hurt. If you are too tired, you will not be able to protect yourself as well. I'm afraid for you. She pushed a potato around the plate with her fork. Her voice was hardly more than a whisper. I'm so sorry you had to be pulled into this mess. I don't want you to have to kill people. I didn't want you to have to kill those men downstairs. That's the other reason I did what I did. So you would not have to kill them. He looked over at her as she stared down at her plate. It hurt his heart to see the look of pain on her face. He gave her a playful shove with his shoulder. I wouldn't have missed this journey for anything. It gives me time to be with my friend. She looked at him out of the corner of her eye as he smiled. She smiled back and put her head against the side of his shoulder for a second before eating the potato. Her smile warmed him. Why did you want me to ask the boy to take care of the horses? Results? That's what you said was most important. The poor kid is hopelessly in love with you. Since you were the one who asked, he will guard the horses better than we could ourselves. She looked at him as if she didn't believe him. You have that effect on men, he assured her. Her smile faded a little, taking on a haunted look. Richard knew he was getting too close to her secrets, so he said nothing else. When they finished eating, she walked to the basin, dipped the end of a towel in the water, and went to Zed. She wiped his face tenderly, then looked over to Richard. He is the same, no worse. Please, Richard, let me have first watch. Get some sleep? He nodded, rolled himself into the bed, and was asleep in seconds. Sometime in the early morning, she woke him for his watch. As she went to sleep, he washed his face with the cold water, trying to wake up, then sat on the bench, leaning against the wall, waiting for any sign of trouble. He sucked on a piece of dried fruit, trying to get the bad taste out of his mouth. An hour before sunrise, there was an urgent knock at the door. Richard? A muffled voice called. It's Bill. Unbolt the door. There's trouble. Chapter 16 Kaylin sprang out of bed, rubbing the sleep from her eyes as Richard unbolted the door. She pulled her knife. Bill, breathing hard, squeezed in and pushed the door shut with his back. Beads of sweat dotted his forehead. What is it? What's happened? Richard asked. Everything was pretty quiet. Bill swallowed, catching his breath. Then a little while ago, these two fellows showed up, right out of nowhere. Big men, thick necks, blonde hair, good looking, armed to the teeth. The kind of men you try not to look in the eye. He took a few deep breaths. Richard stole a quick glance at Kalen's eyes. There was no doubt in them as to who the men were. Apparently, the wizard trouble the quad had run into wasn't trouble enough. Two? Richard asked. You were sure there weren't more? Only saw two come in, but that was enough. Bill's wide eyes looked out from under his curly eyebrows. One was tore up pretty good, arm in a sling. Big claw cuts down his other arm. Didn't seem to bother him any, though. Anyway, they started asking about a woman that sounded a lot like your lady here, except she isn't wearing a white dress like they described. They started for the stairs, and a quarrel broke out about who was going to do what with her. Your red-haired friend jumped the one with the sling and slit his throat from ear to ear. 
The other fellow cut down a bunch of my customers in a heartbeat. I've never seen anything like it. Then all of a sudden, he just wasn't there anymore, vanished into nothing. There's blood everywhere. The rest of the lot are down there right now arguing about who's going to be first to... He glanced at Kalen, leaving the rest unsaid. He wiped his forehead with the back of his arm. Randy's bringing the horses to the back. You have to get out now. Head for Addie's. The sun's an hour away, the hounds too, so you'll be all right. But not if you delay. Richard grabbed Chase's legs, Bill his shoulders. He told Kalen to bolt the door and get their things together. With Chase in their arms, they trudged down the back stairs and out into the darkness and rain. Lamplight coming from the windows reflected in the puddles, giving the wet black forms of the horses yellow highlights. Randy was waiting, looking worried as he held the horses. They dropped Chase in a litter and ran as quietly as possible up the stairs. Bill scooped Zed into his arms while Richard and Kalen threw on their cloaks and grabbed the packs. The three of them, Bill, Richard, then Kalen, raced down the stairs and for the door. As they burst out the door, they almost tripped over Randy, sprawled on the ground. Richard looked up just in time to see the red-haired man lunging. He leapt back, narrowly missing the sweep of the long knife. The man went face first into the mud. With surprising quickness, he came to his knees, enraged, and then went rigid, the sword point an inch from his nose. The air rang with the sound of steel. The man looked up with vicious black eyes. Water and mud ran from the strings of his hair. Richard flicked the sword a quarter turn in his hand and whacked him hard over the head with the flat of the blade. He went down in a limp heap. Bill laid Zed in the litter while Kalen turned Randy over. One eye was swollen shut. Rain splattered on his face. He groaned. When he saw Kalen with his one good eye, he broke into a grin. Relieved that he wasn't hurt worse, she gave him a quick hug and helped him up. He jumped me, Randy said apologetically. I'm sorry. You are a brave young man. You have nothing to be sorry for. Thank you for helping us. She turned to Bill. You too. Bill smiled and gave a nod. Zed and Chase were quickly covered with blankets and oilcloth and the packs loaded. Bill told them that Addie's supplies were already on Chase's horse. Richard and Kalen mounted their horses. She flipped the silver coin to Randy. Payment on delivery as promised, she told him. He caught the coin and grinned. Richard bent down and clasped hands with Randy and thanked him earnestly, then pointed angrily at Bill. You, I want you to add everything to your tally book. Include all the damage, all your time and trouble, even the grave markers. I want you to add a fair fee for saving our lives. If the council doesn't want to approve payment, you tell them that you saved the life of the brother of the first counselor. And Richard Cipher said, if they don't pay, I'll personally have the head of the man responsible, and I will put it on a pike on the front lawn of my brother's house. Bill nodded and laughed over the sound of the rain. Richard pulled back on the reins to keep his horse in place as it danced about, eager to go. He pointed down at the unconscious man in the mud. He was furious. The only reason I didn't kill this man is because he killed a man worse than himself, and in so doing may have unwittingly saved Kalen's life but he is guilty of murder, intent to murder, and intent to rape. I suggest you hang him before he wakes. Bill looked up at him with hard eyes. Done. Don't forget what I said about the boundary. Trouble comes. Take care with yourself. Bill held Richard's eyes as he put his hairy arm around his son's shoulders. We won't forget. A slight smile curled the corners of his mouth. Long life to the seeker. Richard looked down at him in surprise and then grinned. Smiling quenched some of the fire of his rage. When I first saw you, Richard said, my thought was that you were not a devious man. I find I was mistaken. Richard and Kalen pulled their hoods up and urged their horses on into the dark rain toward the Bone Woman. The rain had quickly drowned the lights from South Haven and left the travelers to grope their way through the blackness. Chase's horses had carefully picked their way down the trail. Trained by the wardens for this kind of duty, they were comfortable in the adverse conditions. Dawn had struggled interminably at bringing light to the new day. Even after Richard knew the sun was up, the world still hung in half-light between night and day, a ghost of morning. The rain had helped to cool his hot rage. Richard and Kalen knew that the last member of the quad was loose somewhere, and they watched every movement as a potential threat. They knew that sooner or later he would come at them. The uncertainty of when ate at their concentration. Worry over what Bill had said, that Zed and Chase wouldn't last long, gnawed at his spirit. If this woman, Addie, couldn't help, 
he didn't know what he would do. If she couldn't help, his two friends would die. He couldn't imagine a world without Zed. A world without his tricks and help and comfort would be a dead world. He realized that he was getting a lump in his throat, thinking about it. Zed would tell him not to worry about what might be, but to worry about what was. But what was seemed almost as bad. His father had been murdered. Dark and Rahl was close to obtaining all the boxes. Richard's two oldest friends were near death. He was alone with a woman he cared about, but wasn't supposed to care about. She still kept her secrets closed to him, locked away. He could tell she fought a constant battle over it in her mind. Sometimes, when he felt he was getting closer to her, he saw pain and fear in her eyes. Soon they would be in the Midlands, where people knew what she was. He wanted her to be the one to tell him. He didn't want to learn it from someone he didn't know. If she didn't tell him soon, he would have to ask her. Against his nature or not, he would have to. So deep was he in thought, he hadn't realized they had been on the trail for over four hours. The forest was drinking in the rain. Trees loomed dark and huddled in the mist. The moss on their trunks was vibrant and lush. It stood out on the bark of trees and in round humps on the ground, green and spongy. The lichen on the rocks shone bright yellow and rust in the damp. In some places, water ran down the trail, turning it into a temporary creek. The poles of Zed's litter splashed through it, going over rocks and roots, rocking the old man's head from side to side on the rougher sections. His feet rode inches from water when they crossed runoff streams. Richard smelled the sweetness of wood smoke in the stillness. Birch wood. He realized that the area they were entering had changed somehow. It looked the same as it had for hours, yet it was different. Rain floated down in quiet reverence for the forest. The whole place felt somehow sacred. He felt like an intruder, disturbing the peace of timeless ages. He wanted to say something to Kalin, but it seemed as if talking would be a sacrilege. He understood why the men from the inn wouldn't come up here. Their foul presence would be a violation. They came to a house that so blended with its surroundings, it was almost invisible next to the trail. A wisp of wood smoke curled from its chimney up into the misty air. The logs of the walls were weathered and ancient, matching the color of the surrounding trees with nothing other than the ground it sat upon disturbed. The house seemed to be growing from the forest floor, with trees towering around it protectively. The roof was covered in a mass of ferns. A smaller slanted roof covered a door and a porch large enough for only two or three people to stand on at once. There was a square, four-paned window in the front, and another on the side of the house Richard could see. None had curtains. In front of the old house, a patch of ferns bowed and nodded when water from the trees dripped onto them. Mist turned their distinctive dusty pale green light in the wetness. A narrow path slipped through their midst. In the center of the ferns, in the center of the path, stood a tall woman, taller than Kalin, not as tall as Richard. She wore a simple tan robe of a coarse weave with red and yellow symbols and decorations at the neck. Her hair was fine and straight, a mix of black and gray, parted in the middle, chopped square with her strong jaw. Age had not stolen the handsome features of her weathered face. She leaned on a crutch. She had but one foot. Richard brought the horses to a slow halt in front of her. The woman's eyes were completely white. I be Addy. Who be you? Addie's voice had a harsh, throaty, raspy quality that sent a shiver up Richard's spine. Four friends, Richard said in a respectful tone. Light rain fell in a hushed, soft patter. He waited. Fine wrinkles covered her face. She took the crutch from under her arm and folded both thin hands over the top, lending her weight to it. Addie's thin lips pulled tighter in a slight smile. One friend, she rasped. Three dangerous people. I decide if they be friends. She nodded slightly to herself. Richard and Kalin stole a sidelong glance at each other. His guard went up. He felt somehow uncomfortable, sitting on the horse, as if talking down to her suggested disrespect. He dismounted. Kalin followed his lead. With his horse's reins in his hand, he moved to stand in front of the animal, Kalin next to him. I am Richard Cipher. This is my friend, Kalin Amnell. 
The woman studied his face with her white eyes. He had no idea if she could see, but he didn't know how it could be possible. She turned to Kalin. The woman's raspy voice spoke a few words to Kalin in a language he couldn't understand. Kalin's eyes held the old woman's, and she gave Addie a slight bow of her head. It had been a greeting, a greeting of deference. Richard hadn't recognized the words Kalin or Amnel anywhere in it. The fine hairs on the back of his neck stiffened. Kalin had been addressed by title. He had been around Kalin long enough to know that by the way she was standing, with her back straight and her head held assertively up, she was on guard, serious guard. If she had been a cat, her back would be arched, her fur standing on end. The two women faced each other. Age had been dismissed for the moment by each. They measured each other on qualities he couldn't see. This was a woman who could bring them to harm, and he knew the sword wasn't going to protect him. Addie turned back to Richard. Put words to your need, Richard Cipher. We need your help. Addie's head bobbed. True. Our two friends are hurt. One, Del Branstone, told me he is your friend. True, Addie said again in her raspy voice. Another man in South Haven told us you may be able to help them. In return for your help, we brought you supplies. We thought it would be fair to offer you something. Addie leaned closer. Lie! She thumped her crutch once on the ground. Richard and Kalen both jerked back a little. Richard didn't know what to say. Addie waited. It's true. The supplies are right here. He turned a little, indicating Chase's horse. We thought it would be fair. Lie! She thumped her crutch once again. Richard folded his arms, his temper rising. His friends were dying while he played games with this woman. What is a lie? We be a lie, she thumped her crutch again. You be the one who thought to offer supplies. You be the one who decided to bring them, not you and Kalen. You, we be a lie. I be the truth. Richard unfolded his arms, holding them out to his sides. What difference does that make? I, we, what does it matter? She stared at him. One be true, one be a lie. How much more difference could there be? Richard folded his arms across his chest again, frowning. Chase must have a very difficult time telling you the stories of his adventures. Addie's small smile came back. True, she nodded. She leaned a little closer, motioning with her hand. Bring your friends inside. She turned, put the crutch back under her arm, and worked her way to the house. Richard and Kalen looked at each other, and then went to get Chase, putting the blankets away first. He had Kalen take the boundary warden's feet. He took the heavy half. As soon as they lugged Chase through the door, Richard discovered why she was called the Bone Woman. Bones of every kind stood out in stark relief against the dark walls. Every wall was covered. Against one were shelves that held skulls, skulls of beasts Richard didn't recognize. Most were fearsome-looking with long, curved teeth. At least none were human, he thought. Some of the bones were assembled into necklaces. Some were decorated into objects of purpose with feathers and colored beads, chalk circles drawn around them on the surface of the wall. There were stacks of bones in the corner, looking unimportant en masse. The ones on the wall were displayed carefully, with space around them to signify their importance. On the mantel over the fireplace was a rib bone as thick as Richard's arm, as long as he was tall, with symbols he didn't recognize carved in dark lines along its length. There were so many bleached bones around him that Richard felt as if he were in the belly of a dead beast. They set Chase down while Richard's head swiveled around looking. Rainwater dripped off Kalen, Chase, and himself. Addie towered over him. She was as dry as the bones around her. She had stood outside in the rain, yet she was dry. Richard reconsidered the wisdom of his decision to come here. If Chase hadn't told him Addie was his friend, he would not be doing this. He looked to Kalen. I'll go get Zed. It was more of a question than a statement. I will help carry in the supplies, she offered, casting a glance at Addie. Richard gently laid Zed at the bone woman's feet. Together, he and Kalen stacked the supplies on the table. When they had finished, both went and stood next to their friends in front of Addie, both peering at the bones. 
Addie watched them. Who'll be this one? she asked, pointing at Zed. Zedicus Zul Zarander, my friend, he said. Wizard! Addie snapped. My friend, Richard yelled, his anger unhinged. Addie calmly looked up at him with her white eyes while he glared back. Zed was going to die if he didn't get help, and Richard was in no mood to allow that to happen. Addie leaned forward, placing her wrinkled hand flat against his stomach. A little surprised, he stood still while she rubbed her hand in a slow circle as if seeking to discern something. She took her hand back, carefully folding it over the other on the crutch. Her thin lips pulled to the sides in a slight smile as she looked up. The righteous rage of a true seeker. Good. She looked over to Kalen. You have nothing to fear from him, child. It be the anger of truth. It be the anger of the teeth. The good need not fear it. With the aid of her crutch, she took a few steps to Kalen. Addie placed her hand on Kalen's stomach and repeated the procedure. When she was finished, she laid her hand over the crutch and nodded. She looked to Richard. She has the fire. The anger burns in her, too. But it be the anger of the tongue. You have to fear it. All have to fear it. It be dangerous if she ever lets it out. Richard gave Addie a leery look. I dislike riddles. They leave too much room for misinterpretation. If you want to tell me something, then tell me. Tell me, she mocked. Her eyes narrowed. What be stronger, teeth or tongue? Richard took a deep breath. The answer is obviously teeth. Therefore, I choose tongue. Addie gave him a disapproving scowl. Sometimes your tongue moves when it shouldn't. Make it be still, she commanded in a dry rasp. Somewhat embarrassed, Richard kept quiet. Addie smiled and gave a nod. See? Richard frowned. No. The anger of teeth be force by contact, violence by touch, combat. The magic of the sword of truth be the magic of the anger of teeth, ripping, tearing. The anger of the tongue need not touch, but it be forced just the same. It cuts just as quick. I'm not sure what you mean, Richard said. Addie reached out, her long finger stretching to him and lightly touching his shoulder. His head was suddenly filled with a vision, a vision that was a memory, a memory of the night before. He saw the men at the inn. He was standing in front of them with Kalen, and the men were ready to attack. He was grasping the sword of truth, ready for the violence necessary to stop them, knowing that nothing short of blood would suffice. Then he saw Kalen next to him talking to the mob, stopping them, holding them with her words, running her tongue across her lip, giving meaning without speaking. She was taking the fire from them, disarming the depraved without touching them, doing what the sword could not. He began to understand what Addie meant. Kalen's hand swept up sharply and snatched Addie's wrist, pulling the hand away from Richard. There was a dangerous look in her eyes, one that wasn't lost on Addie. I am sworn to protect the life of the Seeker. I do not know what you are doing. You will forgive me if I overreact. I mean no disrespect, but I could not forgive myself if I failed in my task. There is much at risk. Addie looked down at the hand around her wrist. I understand, child. Forgive me for thoughtlessly giving you cause for alarm. Kalen held the wrist a moment longer to make her point, then released it. Addie laid the hand over her other on the top of the crutch. She looked back to Richard. Teeth and tongue work together. Same with the magic. You command the magic of the sword, the magic of the teeth, but that gives you the magic of the tongue also. The magic of the tongue works because you back it with the sword. She turned her head slowly to Kalen. You have both, child. Teeth and tongue. You use them together, one backing the other. And what is a wizard's magic? Richard asked. Addie looked at him, considering the question. There be many kinds of magic. Teeth and tongue be only two. Wizards know them all, save those of the underworld. Wizards use most of what they know. She looked down at Zed. He be a very dangerous man. 
He has never shown me anything but kindness and understanding. He is a gentle man. True, but he also be a dangerous one, Addie repeated. Richard let it drop. And Darkenral, do you know of him? What kind he can use? Addie's eyes narrowed. Oh, yes, she hissed. I know of him. He can use all the magic a wizard does, and the magic a wizard cannot. Dark and Rawl can use the underworld. I see bumps rippled up Richard's arms. He wanted to ask what kind of magic Addie had, but decided better of it. She turned once more to Kalen. Be warned, child. You have the true power of the tongue. You have never seen it. It will be a terrible doing if you ever let it loose. I don't know what you are talking about, Kalen said, her eyebrows in a frown. True, Addie nodded. True. She reached out and gently placed her hand on Kalen's shoulder, working her fingers, bringing her closer. Your mother died before you became a woman, before you were of the age when she could teach you of it. Kalen swallowed hard. What can you teach me of it? Nothing. I am sorry, but I have no understanding of its workings. It be something only your mother can teach when you reached the age of woman. Since your mother did not show you the teaching be lost, but the power be still there. Be warned, just because you were not taught its use does not mean it cannot come out. Did you know my mother? Kalen asked in a painful whisper. Addie's face softened as she looked at Kalen. She nodded slowly. I remember your family name, and I remember her green eyes. They not be easy to forget. You have her eyes. When she carried you, I knew her. A tear rolled down Kalen's cheek, and her voice came in the same painful whisper. My mother wore a necklace with a small bone on it. She gave it to me when I was a child. I wore it always until... until Denis, the girl I called my sister, when she died. I buried it with her. She had always been fond of it. You gave that necklace to my mother, didn't you? Addie closed her eyes and nodded. Yes, child, I gave it to her to protect her unborn daughter, to keep her child safe, that she might grow to be strong like her mother. I can see that she has. Kaylin slipped her arms around the old woman. Thank you, Addie, she said tearfully, for helping my mother. Addie held the crutch with one hand, and with the other rubbed Kaylin's back in genuine sympathy. After a few moments, Kaylin separated from the old woman and wiped the tears from her eyes. Richard saw his opening and went for it with single-minded determination. Addie, he said in a soft voice, you helped Kaylin before she was born. Help her now. Her life and the lives of a great many others are at stake. Dark and Rawl hunts her, hunts me. We need the help of these two men. Please help them. Help Kalen. Addie gave him her small smile. She nodded her head a little to herself. The wizard chooses his seekers well. Fortunately for you, patience be not a prerequisite for the post. Be at ease, I would not have had you bring them in if I did not intend to help them. Well, perhaps you cannot see, he pressed, but Zed especially is in bad shape. His breathing is hardly there at all. Addie's white eyes regarded him with strained tolerance. Tell me, she said in her dry rasp, do you know Kaylin's secret, the one she keeps from you? Richard said nothing and tried to show no emotion. Addie turned to Kalen. Tell me, child. Do you know the secret he keeps from you? Kalen said nothing. Addie looked back to Richard. Does the wizard know of the secret you keep from him? No. Do you know the secret the wizard keeps from you? No. Three blind people? Hmm? Seems I be able to see better than you. Richard wondered what secret Zed was keeping from him. He lifted an eyebrow. And which of these secrets do you know, Addie? She pointed a thin finger at Kalen. Hers only. 
Richard was relieved, but tried to let his face show nothing. He had been on the verge of panic. Everyone has secrets, my friend, and has a right to keep them when there is need. Her smile widened. That be true, Richard Cipher. Now, what about these two? Do you know how to heal them? she asked. No, if I did, I obviously would have already done so. Your impatience is to be forgiven. It be only right for you to fear for the lives of your friends. I bear you no ill will for your concern. But be at ease. They have been receiving help from the moment you brought them in. Richard gave her a confused look. Really? She nodded. They be struck down by underworld beasts. It will take a time for them to wake. Days. How many, I cannot say. But they be dry. Lack of water will be the death of them. Therefore, they must be brought awake enough to drink or they will die. The wizard breathes slow, not because he be worse, but because that be the way wizards save strength in time of trouble. They go into a deeper sleep. I must bring them both awake to drink. You will not be able to talk to them. They will not know you, so be not afraid when you see it. Go to the corner. Bring the water bucket. Richard retrieved the water and then helped Addie lower herself to sit cross-legged at the heads of Zed and Chase. She pulled Kalin down next to her. She asked Richard to bring a bone implement from the shelf. Part of it looked very much like a human thigh bone. The entire object had a dark brown patina and looked to be ancient. Down the shaft of the bone were carved symbols Richard didn't recognize. At one end were two skull tops, one to each side of the ball. They had been cut smoothly into half spheres and covered with dried skin of some kind. In the center of each skin was a knot that looked like a navel. Spaced evenly around each skin where it stretched across the skull edge were tough of coarse black hair tied on with beaded thread that matched that around the neck of Addie's robe. The skull tops looked like they could be human. Something inside rattled. Richard handed it respectfully to Addie. What makes the rattle? Without looking up, she said, Dried eyes. Addie shook the bone rattled gently from side to side over the heads of Zed and Chase while mumbling a chant in the strange language in which she had spoken to Kalin. The rattle made a hollow wooden sound. Kalin sat cross-legged next to her, head bowed. Richard stood back and watched. After ten or fifteen minutes, Addie motioned with her hand for him to come closer. Zed suddenly sat up and opened his eyes. Richard realized she wanted him to give him water. She continued to chant as he dipped the ladle in and held it up to Zed's mouth. He drank thirstily. Richard was thrilled to see the old man sit up and open his eyes even if he couldn't talk even if he didn't know where he was. Zed drank half a bucket of water. When finished, he lay back down and closed his eyes. Chase was next, and he drank the other half of the water. Addie handed Richard the bone rattle and asked him to return it to the shelf. Next, she had him bring the bone pile from the corner and stack half over Zed's body, half over Chase's, directing him on how to place each bone to some alignment that only she could see or understand. Finally, she had him stack rib bones in a wagon wheel pattern with the hub centered over each man's chest. When he finished, she complimented him on doing a fine job, but he felt no pride because she had directed his hand at each turn. Addie looked up at him with her white eyes. Can you cook? Richard thought about the time Kalin had told him that his spice soup was like hers and that their two lands were much the same. Addie was from the Midlands. Maybe she would like something from her homeland. He smiled at her. I would be honored to make you some spice soup. She put her hands together in a swoon. That would be wonderful. I have not had a proper spice soup in years. Richard went to the opposite corner of the room and sat at the table, cutting up vegetables and mixing spices. For over an hour as he worked, he watched the two women sitting on the floor talking in the strange language. Two women catching up on the news from home, he thought happily. He was in a good mood. Someone was finally doing something to help Zed and Chase. Someone who knew what the problem was. When he was finished and had the soup on the fire, he didn't want to disturb them. They looked like they were enjoying themselves. So he asked Addie if he could cut some firewood for her. She seemed pleased by the idea. 
He went outside and removed the tooth from around his neck, putting it in his pocket, and left his shirt on the porch to keep it dry. He took the sword with him to the back of the house, where Addie had told him he would find the firewood pile. Placing logs on the sawbuck, he cut off pieces to length. Most of the wood was birch, easiest for an old woman to cut. He picked out the rock maple, excellent firewood but tough cutting. The woods nearby were dark and dense, but they didn't feel threatening. They felt welcoming, enveloping, safe. Still, there was the last man of the quad out there somewhere, hunting Kalin. He thought about Michael, hoped he was safe. Michael didn't know what Richard was doing and probably wondered where he was. He was probably worried. Richard had planned on going to Michael's house after they left Zed's place, but there had been no time. Rahl had almost caught them. He wished he had been able to get word to his brother. Michael was going to be in great danger when the boundary failed. When he tired of sawing, he split what he had cut. It felt good to use his muscles, to sweat from labor, to do something that didn't require him to think. The cool rain felt good on his hot body, making the work easier. To amuse himself, he imagined the wood was dark and Raoul's head as he brought the axe down. For variation, he sometimes imagined it to be a gar. When the piece of wood was particularly tough, he imagined it to be the red-haired man's head. Kalin came out and asked him if he was ready to come eat. He hadn't even realized it was getting dark. After she left, he went to the well and poured a bucket of cold water over himself, washing off the sweat. Kalin and Addie were sitting at the table, and since there were only two chairs, he brought in a log round to sit on. Kalin set a bowl of soup in front of him as he sat down and handed him a spoon. You have given me a wonderful gift, Richard, Addie said. And what would that be? He blew on a spoonful of soup to cool it. She looked at him with her white eyes. Without taking offense, you have given me the time to talk to Kalin in my native tongue. You cannot know what joy that be for me. So many years it has been. You are a very perceptive man. You are a true seeker. <laughs>